good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we uh, can start, and uh, I'm supposed to um, do a few reflections on day one before we then start with uh, today's program. Uh, I think from uh, where I'm standing um, at the moment, um, sitting otherwise, uh, I had a very enjoyable day yesterday. I think it was a very um, fruitful, uh, productive day, um, starting with Hans's presentation um, on the theory behind unrest. I think it has been, for me, very rewarding to see how the theory of agonistic memory has been developing over the three years that we have been talking about it, I guess four years even with the preparation time uh, for the grant proposal, uh, and uh, also how the theory has been in conversation with the empirical work packages uh, and our attempts to create agonistic interventions in the theater and in um, the museum. Um, I guess um, I found it sort of uh, interesting to uh, reflect perhaps a bit more about to what extent um, the anti-hegemonic nature of agonistic memory includes uh, the far right. Uh, I think Hans was uh, quite adamant that it does include uh, the far right, that the far right can be anti-hegemonic, uh, but I'm not quite sure how that is squared with the idea of uh, agonism uh, helping to defeat um, the right-wing uh, populism. Um, uh, I think, Hans, you were talking yesterday about uh, agonistic memory creating a kind of conflictual consensus, and I think that's also an interesting idea, but I'm not quite sure what it means. Uh, you know, what, what, what actually is a kind of conflictual consensus uh, it might be something that we want to uh, think about uh, a bit uh, more. I was also thinking uh, yesterday at several points, uh, one of our assumptions, I think reiterated by Hans in the morning, is uh, cosmopolitanism and conflictivity. And um, I'm not sure that cosmopolitanism cannot also be conflictive. Um, you know, I think that um, from where I'm standing, uh, I would say that there is nothing in cosmopolitanism to prevent it from being uh, conflictive. conflictive. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, maybe there is also some, some need to rethink uh, our understanding of cosmopolitanism. Uh, I'm also not so sure anymore whether cosmopolitanism only relates to abstract uh, entities. Um, I think, again, um, from my perspective, we might want to uh, rethink uh, that. Especially if we look at the Spanish case uh, and the, um, the um, excavations of mass graves, it seems to me that uh, we clearly have a kind of anti-hegemonic disruption here, but it is a kind of anti-hegemonic disruption which seems to put cosmopolitan modes of remembering against agonistic, against antagonistic modes of remembering, and agonism is only present to a very limited extent. Um, and it makes me wonder whether actually the Spanish case would be a good case of actually saying we have, if we have anything, we have kind of agonism in a cosmopolitan frame. Um, so it again brings agonism and cosmopolitanism closer together. I think we, we then had a very robust defense of cosmopolitanism by uh, Nathan uh, Schneider. Um, reminding us, I think, that cosmopolitanism can be passionate, passionate not only in defending itself, but I think also in mobilizing passions on behalf of cosmopolitan memory. I think he reminded us also of the experiential nature of cosmopolitanism, of its ability to be conflictual, and of its constant attempts to bring universalism and particularism into conversation with each other. Uh, he also reminded us of the utopian qualities of cosmopolitanism, which are, in my view, another characteristic that brings it closer uh, to agonism. 
Uh, like Anna, um, I was also a bit disappointed uh, that uh, Nathan seems to robustly reject agonism, uh, but it is of course a legitimate position, uh, even if it is one that will hardly serve my own hunch that we should perhaps try and bring agonism and cosmopolitanism into closer conversation and not set them up as mirror opposites. I would say if the aim is to engage with right-wing populism in order to defeat right-wing populism, then cosmopolitanism and agonism are allies and not adversaries. Uh, Paco and Marea then gave a wonderful comparative overview of their studies of mass grave exhumations. I think um, very great sensitivity to individual cases, uh, showing the potential for counter-hegemonic discourses and agonistic interventions, but also demonstrating strong displays of both antagonism and cosmopolitanism. I found their characterization of memory regimes for Spain, Poland, and Bosnia, very convincing. The kind of intertwined memory, the memory modes in disguise, and the parallel memory uh, that you introduced. And I think it's also, uh, it was also very good to see um, the importance of the agency of social movements um, in order to produce kind of agonistic moments when we talk about the uh, excavation of graves. Uh, so I think it, in a way it brings the social movements uh, in um, and perhaps I think we have been talking too little uh, in uh, the unrest project about uh, the importance of the role of social movements uh, for uh, agonistic uh, memory. I also very much liked, I think, Marea's point, um, who first brought up this, uh, I, this um, implicit evolutionism and historical genealogy uh, in uh, the model provided by Anna and Hans, you know, that we, always, we almost have a kind of stage theory um, moving in time from antagonistic memory to cosmopolitan memory and looking forward to agonistic memory. And I would also think that uh, we should uh, discard that. I think it's not useful, in my view, to think of it as a kind of linear uh, process. I think it goes against uh, all of the discussions on historical time that we had over recent years in the history of, uh, in the theory of history. Um, so in that sense, I think we, we need to make sure that we are not talking about uh, historical genealogy when we're talking about these different types of uh, memory uh, regimes. Elizabeth Anstead in her commentary then I think raised very important points about the responsibility of scholars um, for unmasking, she called, I think she said unmasking historical lies, uh, which brings us to the important theme of truthfulness and the relationship um, of history and memory which I think was a strong theme that haunted uh, yesterday's discussions at several points, and I will also uh, come back to this uh, point in a minute. Eleanor and Sophia then introduced the results of the comparative investigation of museums, again, I think, presenting a very complex picture in which cosmopolitan memory modes were strong, but by no means the only show in town. I think we have very strong doses of antagonism present, and if we would have chosen other museums, I think uh, the antagonistic elements would have been even stronger. Um, kind of unofficially, some of us visited other museums, such as the Imperial War Museum in London, or Ridipuglia in, uh, in Italy, and some other museums in East Central and Eastern Europe, and in all of those, I would say antagonistic elements uh, remain uh, extremely strong, and uh, so in, I would by no means say that um, cosmopolitan rules, cosmopolitan memory rules supreme in European uh, war museums. Um, I think um, we also had a very interesting discussion then on art and agonistic intervention, something that was also highlighted in Patricia Violi's commentary. Um, I also very much liked her uh, um, discussion of Latin America, which uh, in a way um, has the potential of decentering um, unrests, rather Eurocentric perspectives on uh, the topic. Um, and her question in, in view of the comparison of Latin America and Europe was, how does the contemporary threat actually influence memory uh, regimes? Um, and uh, I think 
the, uh, the notion of the contemporary in memory, of course, uh, already introduces us to um, someone who has also been looming large over our discussions here, uh, namely uh, Francois Hardoc and uh, his idea of uh, presentism, which very much puts memory against history uh, with his argument that memory is eradicating the difference between the past and the present uh, and avoiding a future that has become unstable. Um, as I said yesterday, I think um, we, we have to see Hartog as a kind of lament uh, about uh, the end of modernist optimism um, and uh, an ongoing commitment to a modernist understanding of historical science. Um, I think uh, part of the problem is that memory studies has not been very deeply rooted in history. There are actually quite few historians uh, who are memory studies scholars. I think uh, other disciplines have been far more prominently represented in memory studies, which perhaps also has led to uh, an ongoing dichotomy in memory studies between uh, history and memory, something that was, of course, first introduced into memory studies by Nora's rediscovery of Halbwachs. Uh, where we already find that kind of strong distinction between history and memory, which in my mind is not uh, helpful. I think we then had um, Christian Wolfs and Daniela's um, reflections on agonistic exhibitions. The, uh, the agonistic exhibition we curated in the Ruhr Museum uh, in Essen, and even if I say so myself, um, I think it is a very impressive attempt uh, to show the possibility uh, or the possibilities of agonism. And I think uh, Pete Chilens in his commentary, Pete from the Flanders Fields Museum, also showed himself impressed, but he also pointed out some weaknesses. Um, uh, I think uh, the need for the visitor to bring already very high levels of knowledge, to be able to contextualize what he sees, uh, to put exhibits into a narrative frame or frames uh, that are largely absent in the exhibition. So I, I think um, he, what he was suggesting is that uh, it is a very good exhibition for curators, uh, but not for the general public. So a very good exhibition to generate ideas for curators on what to do in museums, but maybe uh, an exhibition that leaves a wider general public a little bit uh, puzzled. I also very much like Pete's um, recollections from Ypres uh, when he grew up in Ypres of, I guess, what uh, he describes as a kind of cosmopolitanism from below, uh, that there is actually a, a sort of a, a, a movement from below which uh, immediately recognizes cosmopolitanism as something valuable and worthwhile which uh, goes a little bit against sort of Nathan's uh, idea of cosmopolitanism as the kind of uh, noble aristocracy uh, posited against the kind of plebeian antagonism, uh, because here we have a kind of plebeian, you could say, cosmopolitanism coming up uh, from, uh, from below, which uh, I, th I thought was a very good, very good uh, example. I think we had other important criticisms uh, from, from Wolf, uh, self-criticism that uh, in preparing the exhibition we basically had no contact with social movements and that it's therefore very much a kind of top-down exhibition which uh, would go against the spirit of, uh, of agonism. And uh, also I think a worthwhile reflection from Hans in a way arguing that maybe we should have strengthened certain red lines going through the exhibition such as the idea of the military industrial complex and the, the kind of capitalist interests that are often associated uh, with war, although of course not, not exclusively. Uh, there are probably also many incidences where war was waged not in the interests but against the interests uh, of uh, capital. Then we had the absolutely fascinating round table with museum professionals uh, where I took most notes, I think, of the day and where I think I learned uh, a lot from a world that, of course, we as scholars are often um, far removed from. And for me, that discussion really brought back powerfully the um, discussions surrounding the relationship between uh, history and uh, memory. Um, in some respects, um, the, um, the notion to what extent uh, history can actually contribute 
to um, an interpretation of the world that um, will make um, the future uh, better. I mean, there is the famous quotation from Charlie Brown from the Peanuts, which is one of the uh, most uh, most liked quotations of my good friend Dion Rusen, uh, when he says, uh, I think Charlie Brown says, I still hope that yesterday will become better. Um, and uh, I think this is a kind of very modernist conception uh, of, uh, of, uh, of history, and whether that is possible or not, uh, I'm not sure, but I think in s several of the things that were said by the curators, there was that hope that somehow museums could contribute to making yesterday better. Um, and uh, in a way, it is about uh, narrating uh, history, uh, about uh, bringing in a strong scientific voice, um, in a way, um, being truthful or as truthful as possible and uh, remaining committed to at least an idea of uh, objectivity um, and um, making that idea strong in the museum. Um, I think the, the big question is whether that is still possible uh, in, or, or whether that still chimes with our ideas what history is. And if we look at the philosophy of history and the theory of history, they have, of course, for a very long time now, uh, since the 1960s, uh, a lot of question marks raised uh, whether that kind of modernist conception of history uh, is, uh, is possible. But I think this is a, a debate uh, that uh, we, um, we hopefully will have. We hopefully will have an opportunity to continue also with uh, museum curators. Um, I think it has been certainly from our perspective in unrest, um, very good to see that there is at least an interest from the side of museums and museum curators in the idea of agonistic memory. Uh, and obviously we have probably been able to convince some more than others, but certainly I hope that we will be able to continue uh, the dialogue in uh, years to come. Um, we then had um, Hans and Diana talking about the theater play by Miko Mikon, uh, the possibility of creating a kind of agonistic, uh, ag agonistic works of art. Um, and they pointed very much to art being able to generate new experiences and uh, fictionality being able to reach where history cannot reach. Um, even if we, I guess, see history more like an art and less like a science, um, then still I think there is that kind of element of um, art uh, that uh, simply uh, it is able to go to places where history for good reasons cannot go because history's modus operandi, uh, source criticism, all the methodologies of academic history writing prevents it from going where art can go. But I think Diana also emphasized that uh, no artwork is agonistic per se. Uh, that uh, she reminds us, she reminded us of the importance of context, of interactions with social actors, and I guess that highlighted again the notion that we have in unrest of agonism as a relational uh, category. Astrid Erl's comments, uh, I think, uh, first of all, I think she was very clearly impressed by the, by the play, although she located it uh, within cosmopolitan memory frames, something that we in unrest perhaps wouldn't disagree with uh, to, uh, to a great uh, extent. Uh, with some agonistic moments. Um, I found interesting, and I think unrest uh, should reflect on this, uh, Astrid's suggestion that agonistic memory was a traveling concept which needed translation, and that we perhaps should reflect on the meanings of agonistic memory in different genres and different media. But uh, here there would also be one of my questions to her. I think sadly she's not with us uh, this uh, morning. But uh, she certainly in her presentation put a very big gap between art and scholarship, arguing that art can be agonistic, it can be openly dialogic, it, it is possible to bring something not to a closure in art, and that this is not possible in scholarship. And she also was very adamant that academics and scholars cannot create art, and artists cannot create scholarship. Uh, so at the bottom of this, I think, is a very strong belief in scientificity, uh, that I'm very used to in finding in fellow historians, but I was very surprised to find it in a literary scholar um, as well. So it would be interesting to discuss that further with her. 
I also found very interesting her comment on whether we should differentiate between the concept of cosmopolitanism and the ways in which the concept has been handled. I think that is a very important point. And I think we need to find in unrest a way of differentiating between the sophistication of theorists of cosmopolitan memory uh, and uh, still um, we need to retain also an ability to criticize the ways in which cosmopolitan memory has been put into practice. And I very much liked her idea of perhaps referring to banal cosmopolitanism, obviously lending this from banal nationalism, but banal cosmopolitanism as a way of, if you like, uh, reducing cosmopolitanism to, um, um, what it, to, to a shade of what it really is in uh, much of its uh, theory. We finished a very exciting day with, uh, for me, intriguing analysis of uh, the MOOC that we did. Uh, I have to admit, as a quasi-illiterate in online learning, it was uh, an eye-opener in terms of the possibilities that are opened up uh, by uh, this technology. Overall, then, I think we had a very rich, a very full day in which we managed to summarize some of the key results of the Unrest project. Um, and uh, I also enjoyed very much engaging with our guests from outside of the Unrest project who brought interesting perspectives, I think. It left me more convinced than ever, uh, and I've talked to some of you about this, that as an Unrest team we should try and produce a statement, uh, possibly in book form, of the results of the project. We have published many articles, but I think if we as a project want to leave a legacy, we need also a kind of legacy publication. Um, and I think that uh, we have written many interesting articles. They will be received in the wider scholarly world, but they will not be received as being the result of one project. Uh, so I think uh, if, we, if, if we want to leave a legacy as a project, we need to think about how we want to do this. And I think we need to start talking about that too. Now to today, which I look forward to very much, as it promises to be another intellectually very exciting day where we engage with those projects that ran more or less parallel with unrest and had great synergies with unrest, particularly Traces and uh, Cohere. And I guess we will listen very carefully to uh, what this morning is titled as Related Perspectives on Agonistic Memory. And uh, we start with uh, Simon Martin and uh, Chris Reynolds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this, I, I wasn't directly, well I'm not directly related to unrest um, at all, but I'm a historian. Um, I've lived in Rome for about 15 years and I've in increasingly been working on uh, issues around memory. Um, so thank you very much for the, for the organisers for inviting me. Um, it, it's a first for me to be able to, uh, to base the title of an academic paper upon an Elvis Presley song. Um, I was very pleased to hear the reference to Charlie Brown. I, was, I, I felt it was quite reassuring that mass, mass popular culture can also uh, have a value. Elvis's song, um, to come back to the point, is about the inability in many ways to get over the loss of uh, somebody who meant so much. And if we change um, Elvis's her to him, um, I think the song's brief lyrics give a really effective summary of uh, post-war post Italy's relationship with fascism uh, and with Mussolini. And that's what I was asked to, to come to talk about uh, to date. So what, I propose, what I'm going to do here is, is to offer some really basic sort of thoughts on the development uh, and historical explanations for memory conflicts in post-fascist um, Republican Italy to offer some context for those, uh, the cases that I'm going to go on to look at, three different case studies there, thereafter. So for the Italianists in the audience, please uh, bear with me and um, uh, accept the, sem the real simplification that I, I acknowledge at this point uh, for the first part. Now, as the, um, the project has, has clarified, one of the key um, aspects of antagonistic memory is that of the group identity, that of the contrast uh, between us uh, us and them, this in a hostile and combative way. Um, and what I would propose here is that post-fascist 
uh, Republican Italy was, was established uh, and developed along very antagonistic lines from its beginnings. And I say this very much with the, with the, with the caveat, with the warning um, um, that in historical context, I accept that this may have been both understandable uh, and also very much uh, potentially unavoidable. Um, so I want to look at um, three or four key points that I see uh, as, very, as very important in terms of the case studies that I'll come on to. And the first one is that of the memory of the liberation. The 25th of April is Liberation Day in Italy. Uh, it's theoretically a day of memory for the country uh, and its national community. Uh, it marks the beginning of hope following 20 or more years of uh, the dictatorship. Um, it is um, the end of fascism, effectively, the end of the Nazi fascist occupation. But for many people in Italy, it's simply become a, uh, a national holiday, a day off of work, more than a remembrance or a commemoration or the recognition of a, de a decisive moment. So the liberation by its nature naturally marginalises those who didn't uh, necessarily support the liberators, didn't necessarily support the resistance. So principally we're talking about fascist supporters, um, its followers, uh, people who haven't been part of the story as it's been narrated in the post-war period. Now those, for those people who have been marginalised, um, this marginalisation in many ways is made worse by um, uh, their interpretation and to a degree the reality of the, the, of the responsibility as perpetrators that the resistance actually had as well, particularly in the immediate uh, post, uh, the immediate months in the post-war period. So the result of, of this quite simply is that, that the memory of the liberation is not singular, um, it's multiple, it's dependent upon a number of often conflicting uh, collective and individual memories and experiences. Now if we turn beyond um, the, the, re the resistance to the immediate post-war period and the settlement, well, the resistance effectively comes to power in 1945. The first Prime Minister is a leading member of the resistance, but this does not translate into the, re the resistance um, ideals emerging as a key part of national identity. Uh, nothing like Nuremberg happens in Italy. Uh, defeated fascists are reabsorbed into the fold. Uh, many war criminals escape punishment. There is great continuity in the, um, the judicial education systems in the state administration. This leads to a state which is, um, we can say, very conservative in, in, in its um, implementations of the, the Italian constitution, which in some aspects is really quite radical. Um, this um, is also compounded by the politics of the Cold War. Italy is a very important Cold War country. Um, the defense of democracy against the supposedly uh, anti-democratic uh, Italian Communist Party sees the development of two very large uh, opposing antagonistic fronts within Italy. The Christian Democratic Party with the support of America, uh, backing of the Vatican, uh, and the uh, Italian Communist Party. So the result, I would argue, of that is a, is a republic that is anti-fascist in theory, but has no real strong identity or common history which is built around this. Now, despite that, the resistance itself continues to be portrayed um, as a popular, uh, popular patriotic fight for freedom against the Nazi occupiers and fascist supporters. Effectively, the triumph of the good majority over the evil, bad, Minority. Now, this in itself is quite uh, debatable, um, but what this antagonistic portrayal does encourage is, in many ways, the ideas of, of a lost cause, particularly among uh, that defeated minority. Now, this portrayal is also um, partly constructed by the Communist Party itself, uh, which becomes accused of putting ideology before historical truth. Um, consequently, in its representation of its role within the resistance, it marginalises the involvement of other groups. The Communist Party is um, the largest group, perhaps, in the resistance, but there are other representatives, socialists, Christian Democrats, Action Party. So it is not just a communist story. So what this does, effectively, is rival alternative versions. Again, it undermines the development of maybe a, a consensual national narrative. 
And the consequence of that is a lasting division within Italy, a division, a divided memory that John Foote has talked about uh, a lot, um, uh, a divided memory that lasts until really the, uh, the early 1990s. When we get a great change in uh, politics with Italy and the development of a rise of revisionism, a new look um, at fascism, a weakening of anti-fascism in many ways in Italy. Now this is partly explicable, I think, by a, a loss of a direct contact with the past, a generational shift away from memory rooted in the lived experience. People are, if people are dying effectively, so there is a loss, uh, direct loss of that memory. It is also impacted by international events, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, the effective bankruptcy of the communist alternative to democracy in Europe. This sees the transformation of the Italian Communist Party into a, an even more moderate left-wing party uh, in which revisionism is potentially tolerated or maybe not challenged um, in the seek to appeal to the mass electorate. Now at the same time as this we also get the emergence of new right-wing parties um, and these new right-wing parties also look at the resistance uh, very much as part of the past almost as obsolete, something that we no longer need to think about or consider. So a consequence of this is that fascism itself becomes to be seen or interpreted as a, bit, a benign dictatorship. Uh, while it hasn't necessarily become good, uh, it isn't completely bad. Communism and Nazism within this discourse are presented uh, as equally dangerous. So having propose some explanations um, for the foundations, what I would argue about the Republic's antagonism. What I want to now turn to are some examples of different memory modes in action in contemporary Italy. And these are principally based upon, upon my teaching experience. I've, I've lived in Rome, as I say, for 15 years. I've taught here for 10 or 12 years now. Um, and I have a class specifically on fascism uh, and memory. And within this uh, class, in encouraging students to think about the long-term memory of fascism Within Italy, we take a weekend field trip and we go to the Fossoli uh, deportation camp. Uh, we go to the Museum of the Political and Racial Deportee at uh, Carpi. We go to Mussolini's birth and resting place of Prodapio. And we also uh, visit Forli and a number of fascist uh, built buildings in the city. So these are the issues, some of the issues that I want to think about. The Fossoli um, deportation camp was initially built in 1942 for prisoners of war. Um, in December 1943, under the auspices of Mussolini's Nazi, um, the Nazi fascist puppet state, um, it was transformed into a concentration camp, principally for Jews. And from 1944, it became a transit camp en route to um, the labour and extermination camps in Nazi-occupied Europe. There are around 5,000 or more um, political and racial prisoners that pass through Fossoli. Now, what I want to look at here is not um, specifically the camp, but the related uh, Museum of the Political and Racial Deportee in the nearby town of Carpi. Um, the museum uh, was inaugurated in 1973. Uh, it was one of the first statements about the importance of the deportations and the need to create a public memorial to them. It offers um, what I think is quite clearly a, a cosmopolitan form of memory that focuses principally upon the victims. Um, but I wonder, thinking about it, partly as a result of, very much as a result of this project uh, and, and this, this conference in many ways, um, if there is some perhaps quite early but uh, unintentional agonistic content. It's a very unusual um, museum, in my opinion, for Italy. Uh, it's, housed, it's housed in a, uh, uh, a medieval castle in the middle of Carpi. So there is a, an immediate dialogue with the town itself uh, and the town's role in the events. Its vaulted um, rooms uh, give it a kind of sacred sense. It's an unusual space for a contemporary museum and a contemporary topic. Um, unlike uh, Many Italian museums, it's not filled with objects and historical documents. Um, it doesn't attempt to tell um, a story of the deportation. It tries specifically to evoke it. It tries to arouse feelings, uh, to recall memories and sentiments that people have about the event. Um, it tries to do this through uh, artistic, um, different artistic forms. 
So graffiti uh, engraved into the walls, um, display cabinets, um, phrases, all of which appear to be uh, in dialogue. The huge wall image here um, appears to relate to um, the, uh, the depersonalization process. The display cabinet has an enlarged photo of a pile of anonymous bodies. At the bottom of it, the small urn and the ash show the extreme end consequences of this narrative. It is very much uh, an emotional, um, more, than, more than a visual experience. Um, it's quite unconventional. It's a museum which is deliberate specifically not to visit in silence. Visitors are encouraged to read aloud passages of letters from members of the European resistance uh, who have been condemned to death. So in this sense, it also contextualizes the Italian experience within the wider European one. In um, the second room, we have um, different cabinets, um, only three cabinets once again, with very few ob objects. Again, they symbolize the experience of the camps. Objects used to identify the victims, objects that refer to the perpetrator, uh, an SSID card here, a riding crop, a whip, um, and objects relating to the system of forced labor. Um, not quite clear in the photo, but at the, the top here, just some barbed wire. Uh, from the camp. Now, these display cabinets are set at different, uh, at different levels. Uh, the victims, images of the victims being placed below ground, the perpetrators being above ground. There's no explanation of this once again. The thematic tour of the 13 rooms concludes in the room of names, uh, with the names of 14,000 Italians who were deported. So, for me personally, it's quite striking as uh, uh, the curation of the museum. It goes beyond simply focusing upon the deportees. Um, but nonetheless, the perpetrators, are, I think, are portrayed uh, ant quite antagonistically. They're quite evil. There's little sense of where this comes from. Um, the Italian role within this narrative is hinted at. And I think this is still um, a very challenging idea in Italy in, in the 1970s, uh, when the debate about consen mass consensus uh, has really barely begun in this country. But there's no real critical analysis of mass involvement or responsibility. So in these aspects, I, I, and the questions the museum raises, the emotions it generates, it provokes, I, I wonder if there is something perhaps unintentionally antagonistic about it. It's certainly a product of, it, a product of its time uh, in the 1970s, and it offers quite a striking example, to, the, to um, a contrast to the next example, uh, which is situated just outside Predapio in northern Italy. Now, Predapio is, is um, unquestionably very, very powerful in the identity of Romagna. Uh, Predapio is kind of around about here. Um, Romagna is, or Emilia Romagna lies, or Predapio lies within what was, you can see from this map, referred to as a formula, former communist uh, dominated red belt of Italy. So it has a very strong communist identity. But as Mussolini's birthplace, uh, Predapio also develops a strong identity based upon a certain pride and association with its son. So not surprisingly, it is also the site of a neo-fascist rally uh, three times a year, uh, plus individual pilgrimages which happen on, on a, uh, certainly on a weekly basis. Um, there are numerous souvenir shops. Um, and the main attraction is that of Mussolini's tomb himself, um, a tomb with a book of condolence or remembrance in front, uh, framed certifications from various neo-fascist groups um, across the country. Now, what I want to look at is um, a, a different uh, museum uh, as such, which is um, just a couple of kilometers down the road. Uh, it was the former residence or the former summer residence of the Mussolini family until quite recently. Um, the Villa Carpena now contains a, a collection of memorabilia associated with Mussolini uh, and the family. Its, its commentary is um, overtly um, pro-Mussolini. It offers an unapologetic, very partial uh, interpretation of the historical past. It offers very little context. It promotes a history and an image of fascism and its leader as both misunderstood and betrayed. Um, this is expressed uh, with great emotion 
and a distinct lack of any reflexivity. So the result is a very clear antagonistic form of, uh, form of memory. Um, it creates a sense of belonging amongst its supporters via a very heroic, victimised and defensive narrative. And I think this is, um, for me, as, 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 a, as, a, as a teacher, the real, the, the, the agonistic ed educational challenge. And so I've asked myself many times, and, and, and I'm still doing this very much, and what are the merits of taking students to this site, to the museum, to the town, to Mussolini's tomb? Um, is this antagonistic? Is it perhaps just voyeuristic? It's something that I've really and still struggle with. Um, it's very, very difficult for me to do as a teacher. Um, it's also pretty difficult for the students. Um, it's occasionally controversial, um, but that says it's deeply memorable. Um, it's a deeply memorable experience that can relate to other examples outside of Italy. Um, dialogue can certainly be very conflictual. Um, it is certainly not consensual. Uh, even if consensual dialogue is really not expected. Um, students themselves are, very, are encouraged to confront some of the ideas that they're presented with during the visit, but this is obviously uh, quite difficult for them, so we often talk about these afterwards. Um, the, the question that I ask is, if the, we didn't go, what, what does this also do? Knowing about this site, I think not going certainly leaves the students unexposed to the existence of these ideas and sites within Italy. And for American students, many of whom I teach, it is a deeply um, revealing and quite shocking um, experience that people like this actually exist. And I also think that not going and talking with some of the people who run this museum would affirm uh, their narrative about being excluded from the national narrative. It would reaffirm the idea about us maybe not listening or hearing, accepting ideas about things that we don't necessarily like or agree with. So the goal of the, the visit in many ways is to try to expose the, the differences between the views um, of these nostalgics and our views, our uh, understanding interpretation of history. It perhaps introduces to the students the idea that democracy is about conflict, it is about struggle, and hence perhaps it is agonistic. But the problem that remains is how to deal with the blatant lies and the mistruths. Um, is the genuine discomfort which we all experience really worth it? Um, how do you talk to people who, who, who really don't want to discuss? Um, and is any useful dialogue really possible out of this visit? Again, I repeat, it's something that I, I don't really have, have an answer to. Um, dialogue itself is, the, is, the, is the, the key to the final example that I want to turn to, uh, of what we look at on this trip, and that's um, about the restoration of uh, the town of Forli, um, the former youth organization building, the, the GIL building, the Gioventù Italiana del Littorio. Um, this is of widespread recognized architectural value, um, but the building itself has created quite a lot of discomfort within the town. Why is it uncomfortable? Well, that goes again back to the town's quite, um, and the region's quite conflicting history. Um, it's a medium-sized medieval provincial city, but Fordley undergoes quite significant urban development under the fascist regime, principally due to its proximity to Prodapio and the birthplace of Mussolini. Now, the dual building is an unavoidable part of um, Fordley's fascist heritage. Um, it symbolizes very much the regime. It symbolizes the regime um, quite implicitly through its architectural style, but it also symbolizes the regime explicitly in the oath on both sides of the tower, which was sworn by uh, members of the e fascist youth organization Balila and later on the Gioventù Italiana del Littorio. So it's a clear act of allegiance. Now, in the week of the fall of Mussolini in July 1943, the words that you can see on the side of the tower here um, were subjected to an iconoclastic attack. They were originally set in relief in white marble um, and they are hacked off. They're removed um, and left. So in the process of this act, the jewel then becomes part of a local memory which is also very much connected um, to its, anti, its strong anti-fascist 
partisan movement, so it develops a kind of double identity once again. So the, the Council's um, decision on how to approach the restoration of this building and the oath was quite complicated. Um, and it was taken by a broad committee from a pro across um, civil and uh, political bodies. This included representatives from uh, majority and minority groups on the City Council and other councils um, from nearby with very similar, to, similar heritage and, and problems. It, was take, it included the Historical Institute of the Resistance, um, which was established in the aftermath of the war uh, to offer a consistent and historical account of fascism. This is effectively a kind of left-leaning uh, democratic consensus. It also included architectural experts from the universities of Bologna uh, and Florence. And the decision that the committee came up with was to um, provide a testimony to the effects of time and history upon the inscription. So to partially restore the oath, um, the letters uh, that were removed in the original iconoclastic, iconoclastic act in 1943 were not replaced, however. So the tower would be re restored in a way that guaranteed traces of the lettering remain, so its original propagandistic intent remains there for all to see, uh, but the original oath and its iconoclastic, iconoclastic removal are also there, they, la they live together. So there's no negation of its original intention to produce fascist propaganda, but at the same time there's no negation of its history uh, and the local opposition uh, to the regime in the early period of the resistance. Um, and there. So um, I think in many ways this is an argument um, to, to suggest that this is uh, agonism uh, in action. So if um, democracy as unrest as proposes about conflicts and struggles, um, then I think it's reasonable, it may be reasonable to suggest from the evidence here that Italian democracy is in good shape. Um, the, the, the problem is, however, that these struggles in general have not quite reached the stage in which political opponents uh, begin to view each other just as adversaries and not as enemies to be eliminated. Um, the conflict appears to be much closer emotionally than it is chronologically. So I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on, on the antagonism in many ways and the divided memory. The good news is um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a job here for historians and for academics, but the bad news is, as we know, getting consensus um, amongst academics and historians is a tall order in itself. I think what these examples um, show is that agonistic approaches can clearly exist in Italy. Uh, they can produce a positive result without creating future conflict. Uh, but the, this does raise the question that it presupposes in many ways or requires a will on all parties to listen or to simply participate. And that's what I see as the, real, as the kind of problem or the paradox of, of antagonism, particularly in Italy, but it may be in all cases how to accommodate what's ideologically unacceptable. How can we enter a dialogue with somebody who contests the democratic origins and fundamentals of the state, uh, and how much dialogue can democracy actually uh, tolerate? Ultimately, um, does the value of agonistic debate outweigh the risk uh, when confronting and creating uncomfortable situations? Um, personally, I'm still really undecided about this. Um, but um, this conference and the project as a whole, and I thank Everybody who's put so much into this has unquestionably helped uh, and developed my thinking uh, around this, as I'm sure it has for everybody. Thank you. I would first of all like to take this opportunity to thank um, everybody in the Unrest team for uh, not only inviting me to this wonderful conference, but also their genuine interest in my project, um, which uh, examines the case of Northern Ireland's 1968. And as I hope to be able to demonstrate in the 20 minutes that follow, um, I believe that the approach that we've taken, which draws heavily on agonism, um, demonstrates that this is an approach that can be effective, and effective in 
what I would consider to be a very difficult set of circumstances. Um, so it's first of all important to point out um, the underpinning research that has led to this project. I'm just going to set my stopwatch so that Nina doesn't tell me to stop talking. Um, so the, the starting point for this project was around the notion of the transnationalism of 1968. Um, Scholars are, are increasingly in agreement that one must take into consideration the transnational context of 1968 in order to make sense of that. Um, we can talk about that in greater detail later if you wish. But within this increasingly dominant consensual narrative, transnational narrative, one thing that became clear to me was that Northern Ireland was more often than not absent from that uh, transnational narrative. And it would have, you would have been forgiven for believing that Northern Ireland didn't actually have a 1968. Um, this is wrong. Northern Ireland did have a 1968, um, which very much fits in with the characteristics of 1968 more broadly. Um, and what this project um, has sought to do, and what the research has sought to do, is to explain why it is that Northern Ireland has been left out of the transnational narrative, but also to challenge that erroneous absence and to try and right the wrong that is the absence of Northern Ireland in this transnational narrative. Um, so the project, which started with a, with a book and then led to this collaboration with National Museums Northern Ireland, started out with the objective of writing Northern Ireland in to the transnational narrative. And that, has, that was the primary objective. Um, and I think we've accomplished that to a certain degree. However, in so doing, I believe that we have created a set of circumstances that have led to a certain degree of what we call narrative hospitality, which has led to um, the possibility to open out a much more inclusive discussion around 1968, drawing on an agonistic approach, which to some extent has helped us contribute to a discussion about how we should deal with the difficult legacy of the past in Northern Ireland. So, uh, where's the thing? So the project has evolved in four stages, uh, which started with a minor intervention in the permanent gallery of uh, National Museum Northern Ireland's premier site, the Ulster Museum, um, which basically sought to insert some sort of reference to the international context, which up until that point had been largely absent. The project then developed into a complete redevelopment of the permanent gallery, which started to draw on some of the oral history approach of the book um, that I wrote on the subject. And during this second stage of the development, we formed very strong relations with the local curriculum body to create a set of educational resources that linked together what we were doing in the museum with the national curriculum. And this has led to quite a fruitful collaboration between educators and our project. The third stage of the project, which is ongoing, was the curation of an extended temporary exhibition in the Ulster Museum, but alongside that, a travelling exhibition, which is currently travelling all around the world in you know, up to 30 destinations um, in all sorts of different venues. Um, and then the fourth stage, which will be happening very shortly, we'll see the integration of this extended temporary exhibition into the permanent gallery of the Ulster Museum. So the primary objective of writing Northern Ireland's 1968 into the transnational narrative has, in my view, been um, accomplished. Uh, the fact that the, the, the international aspect of 1968 now forms part of the debate because of the success of the project means that that first objective has been reached. However, as I said, something more interesting has happened as a result of it. Because by taking a different perspective on 1968, particularly from an international perspective, we have created a set of circumstances that has led to this idea of narrative hospitality, which basically means that a whole range of people who up until this period would not have been involved in a discussion on 1968 felt comfortable to join in and be part of this project. And I think if we were to try and understand how we've managed the success of this and how it contributes to something broader than simply writing the, the province into a transnational narrative, I think we need to look at 
the theoretical approach, which is of course based on agonism, but also the methodological approach, which is based on oral history. So oral history was um, the, 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 the underpinning methodological approach of the study, and then also the excavation. So we essentially uh, interviewed a range of protagonists, video interviews, and then embedded these testimonies into the exhibitions and the various platforms that we've created. So oral history is at the centre of what we've, we've tried to do with this project. And you know, at, there's a well-trodden um, debate around the, 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 the positives of um, oral history in contributing to helping us understand uh, particularly marginalised voices, and I've included this quote from Thompson, which draws on the, some of the benefits of oral history in general. In the case of Northern Ireland, um, there's a, um, a widespread recognition that within the very specific context of the post-Troubles peace process era, that an, an approach drawing on oral history, storytelling, is actually quite a powerful way for us to try and overcome some of the challenges that, frankly, the political, pro, uh, uh, the political system is struggling to deal with at this moment. And this is where the agonistic approach complements the oral history approach and leads to something that I believe explains the success of this project and the potential that it suggests for um, future developments, particularly in relation to dealing with the legacy of the past in Northern Ireland. So just to give you a very brief context on that, Northern Ireland's troubles came to a conclusion in 1998 um, and since then um, we've been living in an era of peace, fragile peace. Um, one of the big problems in the Northern Ireland peace process that explains why we have a political stalemate at the moment is the fact that there's little agreement over how we deal with the legacy of the past and helping people deal with those very difficult memories. Everybody recognises that this is one of the challenges that we need to overcome and there have been a number of initiatives that have tried to deal with it. But as William pointed out yesterday, the general approach has been not to engage with it too much. So I would, I would argue that there's been a failure to deal with this challenge, and an understandable failure to an extent. I believe that there's been a, there's been a desire to perhaps not open up difficult questions with a view to securing and consolidating the peace that was achieved in 1998. So in the period between 1998 and now, we haven't really dealt with this, but I think we're arriving at a moment where it is time for a new approach. And this is where I believe the approach of agonism can kick in and offer something that would um, provide a blueprint or a, a way out, as it's been described by some of, my, um, some of my interviewees, to this very, very difficult challenge. So when we um, started to think about the range of people who we would interview, it was very clear to us that we, did, we needed to do something more and different to what everybody else had done on 1968 up until this point. So we interviewed uh, 30 people from right across the spectrum in Northern Ireland. Now, I know that for many of you these names will mean nothing, but I make a point of putting them up here simply to say that I am by no means suggesting that I've interviewed everybody. And People quite enjoy telling me that I haven't interviewed everybody and are very good at suggesting people who I should interview or how dare I not interview such and such. But I can say with some confidence that nobody and no project on 1968 has engaged with such a diverse range of voices. And in particular, a group of voices that up until this stage weren't engaging in it, didn't feel as though they could engage in it, um, and people were perhaps not reaching out to them. So the range of voices right across the very contested political spectrum in Northern Ireland is reflected in the way in which we present these testimonies in our various exhibitions. Um, so I thought I would take a couple of examples just to demonstrate the kind of conflicting um, narratives that come out. So one, obviously one of the questions I asked my interviewees was whether or not they believed they were part of the international zeitgeist of 1968, because that was, that was the primary objective. Um, and we've got four examples of responses to this question, and these are the types of 
um, uh, quotes and testimonies that find their way into the, the exhibition. So we have four very different perspectives on the question of international. On the top left we have a lady called Breed Ruddy who's from a very Republican family who very much agrees that what happened in Northern Ireland at that time was part and partial of the international protest movement. On the top right hand side we have Chris McGimsey who's from the Ulster Unionist Party um, and he said yeah yeah I felt part of it however there was something just holding me back particularly this traditional sort of Ulster Unionist background and you know thanks to Brexit you're all starting to understand a bit more what the what the Ulster Unionist and Unionism particularly the DUP stands for and this is very much exemplified in Gregory Campbell's comment on the, the idea that Northern Ireland was part of the international zeitgeist. He completely rejects that idea and instead suggests that it was being used by Republicans as a Trojan horse to kind of challenge the border and, 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 and further their Republican agenda. And then we have um, Aidan McKinney, who was a civil rights activist at the time, who, through no fault of his own, for other reasons that I won't get into, has bought into what I believe to be quite a narrow, convenient consensus on the events of France and suggests that somehow all they were interested in France was kind of sexual liberation and what we were doing in Northern Ireland was much more important. So just in those examples we can see that it's very different. And another example, um, so on the 4th of January 1969, um, a, student a student demonstration, peaceful demonstration, was brutally attacked by a group of, um, let's call them unionist counter-protesters or vigilantes, if you will, um, and this was, it happened on a bridge called Burnt Pollet Bridge, and this moment is seen as a vital turning point in Northern Ireland's 1968, and largely cited as one of those pivotal moments that would lead to the Troubles, and it remains a very contested moment today. Um, so I've put up four um, uh, examples of responses to people's assessment of the incident at Burnt Pollet. And again, there are four very different ones. So on the top left hand side, we have a kind of leading light of the civil rights movement. So in some respects, one would expect him to be very critical. But he says, or sorry, not very critical, but he would be supportive of the students. But he actually expresses that he had some concern about it and that they were being irresponsible. On the right hand side, we have Nelson McCausland, again from the DUP, who also was very critical of it. But then we have on the bottom left hand side Bernadette McCallisky, better you probably better know Bernadette as Bernadette Devlin. Um, and she describes how this triggered a response from within the nationalist community. And then Paul Bew, or Lord Bew, as he prefers to be called, um, <coughs> who's a unionist, but he himself criticizes the response of unionism. So what I, wa what I want, the point I want to make about using this example is that not only do we see divergent and contested narratives across the two sides of the community, what we also see is within the communities themselves there is a much more fragmented picture which needs to be understood if we're going to get close to understanding what happened and why it happened. Um, so just. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples of what the materials look like, so on the left hand side we have the um, permanent exhibition which is going to be replaced. In the middle we have the temporary exhibition hosted at the Ulster Museum. And on the right we have the, the travelling exhibition which, um, as I said, is currently um, making its way around the UK, Ireland and the States. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that the agonistic approach that's clearly used when putting together and compiling the different testimonies that we have in there um, is, in my view, um, it is important to not just assume that we can do this in a museum. I made this point yesterday in relation to the MOOC, um, which I believe um, fits into what I would describe as agonistic contamination. So the idea being that we need to take this agonistic approach and find multiple ways for it to be, to be spread, and this includes very importantly in, in my project, um, the use of um, or the contact with young people and education. But the, the agonistic approach meant that we have created a balanced, 
open-ended exhibition where in many respects we do relinquish control over the narrative. We provide visitors with a whole range of different views without telling them which way they need to think so that they can go away themselves and make up their own minds. Throughout the project we have encouraged participation and participation not just from the people who have been interviewed by the, for the project, who obviously give up their time, donated objects, but have been part and parcel of the many, many events, including study days with um, uh, GCSE students. That participation is also part and parcel of what goes into the exhibition. We encourage visitors to share their reflections on the exhibition, which are then embedded into the exhibition itself as a means to encourage further reflection and participation. We've had a whole range of public facing events, so every time the exhibition travels somewhere there will be a launch event. Um, we had a number of events at the Ulster Museum including a conference which was run and led by the interviewees themselves right across the, the, the range of perspectives, the kind of agonism in action, um, quite fearful before it started but it, it actually turned out to be quite positive. Um, the, perhaps the most potent public events that we've had are the study days where we get um, the students to come, 200 students to come to the museum, get a visit of the gallery and then hear perspectives from a range of people who we've interviewed from the project and then the young people are, are given the possibility to ask questions and of all the things that we do in this project that's the one when you come away thinking we're on to something here, there is hope because the spirit in that room and the, the possibility for those young people to ask questions of people who they would A, never have heard of before and B, never had the chance to dialogue with leads to something quite rich in my opinion. We were insistent on um, creating a travelling version of the exhibition so that we got out of the National Museum Institution and we were, have been fortunate enough to established quite a, an extensive list of destinations which geographically um, we're very pleased with but also in terms of the types of institutions so we haven't just focused on um, museums we deliberately and explicitly sought out libraries because we believe they have a much richer connection with local communities and they get us beyond your typical uh, museum visitor so at the minute as I speak the um, digital version is on view for you all to go and look at in there. Um, one version is in Cork City Library. Another version is in the Irish World Heritage Centre in Manchester. And another version opens in Boston College uh, in, in the States on Monday. So there's a real sense that we're getting this message out there. One of the things that has also been an important consideration in terms of facilitating the mobility of our ex travelling exhibition has been the use of augmented reality. So we have embedded technology into the travelling exhibition which obviously makes it easier to travel around. You don't need the travel screens. You simply put it up and people come along <laughs> and ping their phones off it and the videos pop up. It wasn't just chosen because it helped the mobility of the, of the exhibition, it was also chosen because we believe that it adds another layer of interest, particularly for probably our most important target audience, which is young people. So the technology that we've used and the various platforms, so we've created an iBook of the exhibition which has been it's made it possible to spread it around. We have extended videos which are available on the National Museum's YouTube channel. Um, and the use of our um, augmented reality and a dedicated bespoke online learning resource which has been developed and is in use in all the schools in Northern Ireland and I think it's been sort of downloaded 2,700 times which in the context of Northern Ireland is really quite impressive. So these range of decisions have helped spread the, the potency of our project and helped us reach this idea of um, reinforce agonism and, and, and get towards this idea of agonistic contamination. So how has it been received? That's the most important thing. Yeah, nearly there. Um, of course not everybody's happy um, and in some respects that's um, a backhand compliment. Um, it's inevitable within the context of Northern Ireland when you put such different opposing perspectives together 
and you open up the platform of the National Museum to voices that people wouldn't expect to hear, that's going to lead to a certain degree of fiction. So, a friction. So, I've, I've, put, I've put up these um, two quotes from some of our feedback that demonstrate that some people were happy to express the, that, that they found some of it to be quite difficult. Um, I have to say that within the, the plethora of feedback that we've managed to garner up until now, um, it was quite difficult to find um, too many negative um, comments. In general, the, over, the overarching um, agreement or consensus is that people can see the value in what we're doing, despite the fact that it can be unsettling. So this particular quotation from a visitor to the exhibition really gets it as far as I'm concerned, because it accepts that it's going to be unsettling. It accepts that some people are going to be put off, but what it says is that this is the sort of thing that is necessary. And the reason why I think that's really important, because I think that this reflects where Northern Ireland is at this moment in time. We know that it's going to be difficult, but I think there's a general acceptance that we need to confront the difficulties. So 20 years after the onset of peace, we're in a position now where we're comfortable to take on these very difficult um, questions. So in conclusion, um, I think that by setting aside the idea of chasing some sort of unachievable consensus, which believe me is impossible in Northern Ireland, we have created this idea of a platform, this idea of narrative hospitality, a platform where these contested narratives feel comfortable to come together in this shared space is the term that they, we would use, where they are able to express their contested perspectives. I believe that as a minimum what we can expect and what we started to see in some of the feedback is that it's not going to solve the problems in Northern Ireland. If I knew that, I don't think I'd be standing here. But what it will do is it will contribute to the discussion. It will increase a certain degree of empathy and understanding across the divide, but also between communities themselves. And I think that in that sense it can contribute to the very important discussion around dealing with the legacy of the past, um, so that we can ensure that we don't return to the horrors of the troubles. And I firmly believe that if we can make something like this work in the difficult circumstances that are Northern Ireland, then there are all sorts of potential lessons for elsewhere. Thank you. So I'm not Tony Robbins, as you might have noticed. Um, he unfortunately couldn't join us, so I'm going to read part of his paper. I'm not going to read the introduction where he um, outlines um, many of the memory models, um, but I'm going to, he's going to talk, well, what he wanted to talk about was the, the example of um, Argentina, which I think adds another um, fascinating dimension um, and opens up, open, so that's why I'm reading the paper, basically. It's going to be hard acts to follow, following um, Simon and Chris um, and their presentation, so bear with me, please. So, on politicised cosmopolitan memory, how Argentina remembers the victims of political violence. An agonistic mode of remembering is supposed to overcome the shortcomings of both the politicised, antagonistic and the depoliticised cosmopolitan mode of remembering. Yet, are antagonistic and cosmopolitan memory really contradictory modes of remembering, as has been argued by Anna and Hans in their seminal article on agonistic memory? and therefore require a third mode of remembering that transcends the other two and integrates the best of both modes, namely the emotions and passions of antagonistic memory and the polyphony, solidarity and universalism of cosmopolitan memory. Or are there other modes of remembering that also transcend antagonistic and cosmopolitan memory but do so in a contentious way that will increase antagonism and conflict? I will describe such a mode of remembering with the way in which Argentina remembers the disappeared and thus distances collective identification and memory making from an agonistic mode of remembering that would be so beneficial for this divided society. <coughs> so just a bit of Argentine history to set the stage for, for, for my arguments. 
1973, Argentina had climbed out of seven years of military rule after a leftist guerrilla insurgency and student and worker protests had forced the dictatorship to hold general elections. Many Argentines believed that the country's political violence would now come to an end because most guerrilla organizations agreed to lay down their arms and fight for their ideals with political means. The Peronist party won a landslide electoral victory in May 1973, and their leader, Juan Domingo Perón, returned to power after having lived in exile since 1955. Already at the start of Perón's administration, there were tensions between the revolutionary Peronists with roots in the guerrilla insurgency and the orthodox Peronists backed by the labor unions. These tensions increased by the end of 1973. Each faction of the Peronist movement wanted to gain political influence in Perón's governments, and when they became frustrated in their efforts, they resorted to political assassinations. Political allies during the dictatorship became political adversaries during the time of the elections in early 1973, and then by late 1973 had turned into political enemies. An analysis of the radical magazines from 73 and 74 shows clearly the discursive shift from adversaries to enemies. So here's an example from a leftist magazine that could come straight out of a text by Chantal Mouffe. And I quote, politics deals with the conversion of the adversary while the main theme of the war is either the destruction of the enemy or the annulment of its capacity to respond. End of quote. And what about Argentina's right-wing nationalists? Here's an example of a similar Manichaean discourse. I quote, Comrades, the fight is clear. There are only two fronts, that of the allies and that of the enemies, that of the people and that of the anti-people. End of quote. By 1975, the Argentine armed forces entered into offensive operations against the revolutionary insurgency and desiring a total control over the country and its future, grabbed power in March 1976. The rest is known. Argentina's parliament was dismantled, the media were censored, and between 10 and 30,000 people, mostly members of the guerrilla organizations and the radical political left, were disappeared. The state terrorism could not last. The dictatorship fell from power after increasing labor and human rights protests and losing the Falklands War in 1982. General elections were held in October 1983 and Raul Alfonsín was inaugurated as the new president of Argentina in December 1983 in a celebration of freedom and democracy. Alfonso won the elections on a call for truth and justice and a message of hope for a better future. Yet the celebration of democracy was laced with anxiety about the fate of the disappeared. And this anxiety affected the memory construction of the political violence when democracy returned to Argentina. The concept of dirty war, used during the dictatorship both by the Argentine military and the guerrilla insurgency, was replaced in 83 by President Alfonso with the term two demons theory, despite the criticism by the military and the former guerrillas. Through antagonistic modes of remembering, the military and the former guerrillas accused one another of starting the violence and being the demon in Argentine history. While the Alfonso government blamed them both. This discourse became untenable when the crimes against humanity of the armed forces were revealed through a Truth Commission in 1984 and a major trial against the deposed junta commanders in 1985. By 87, the term state terrorism became more prominent in Argentina's collective memory, with the military as the perpetrators and the former revolutionaries as the victims of repression. At the turn of the 20th century, state terrorism had become the dominant discursive frame to describe the past because the trials against increasing numbers of military officers revealed the systematic atrocities committed by the Argentine armed forces. However, the defendants continued to emphasize that the guerrillas had started the political violence and the armed forces had been waging a just war. Memory politics continued in the form of a politicized, antagonistic mode of remembering. 
And then a discursive change took place around 2005 in which a cosmopolitan mode of remembering deposed the reigning antagonistic mode, yet incorporated its politicised character. The human rights movement began to speak of an Argentine genocide, as we heard yesterday, emphasising that the disappeared were like the victims of the Holocaust. In turn, the military and their supporters developed a cosmopolitan mode of remembering that emphasised a universal solidarity with victims of terrorism worldwide. The Argentine insurgents were now compared to um, Osama bin Laden, and the political violence of the 70s was linked to the terrorism of the 21st century. A young generation of military sympathisers began asking recognition for the victims of terrorism as a counterweight to the recognition for the victims of state terrorism demanded by the human rights movement. The two opposed cosmopolitan memories made appeals for partisan victimhoods that were universalised across national boundaries and historical periods. So what's going on here? Apparently, different cosmopolitan modes of remembering can become extended transnationally and across one's own group on the basis of different abstractions of victims and perpetrators. One could interpret this cosmopolitan pluralism as a switch from a moral manichaeanism, that's when you don't write the paper, to an abstract manichaeanism, where it not for the Argentine, cosmopolitan memories were highly politicised and still are. In order to understand this, it will be necessary to examine the meaning of the concept of genocide in Argentina. The start of Argentina's genocide discourse goes back to 97, when the Spanish judge Baltasar Garzón presented an extradition request for former dictator General Galtieri, who was accused of implementing a, I quote, systematic plan for the dis disappearance and elimination of members of national groups, imposing on them forced displacements of identity and heritage and torture and death, which constitute the crime of genocide, end of quote. He argued that the Argentine junta, like Hitler in Nazi Germany, had tried to establish a new social order through the elimination of a national group. The Argentine disappeared could be defined as a national group on the basis of their shared opposition to the military's regime. The Argentine military had a second motive for committing genocide, according to Garzón. They wanted to systematically destroy an ideological group that was hostile to Argentina's Western Christian civilization. With a legal reasoning in place, Argentine scholars began to provide a conceptual foundation to the Argentine genocide. This scholarly argument was accepted by an Argentine judge who in 2006 convicted a police inspector general to life in prison for, as he wrote, human rights violations committed in the framework of a genocide that had taken place in the Argentine Republic between 1976 and 1983. The verdict, imp the verdict implied a category shift from state terrorism to genocide and was immediately adopted by the human rights movement. This discursive frame changed the historical narrative of the political violence and changed the research interests of historians. The Holocaust su became suddenly a relevant frame of reference. Books appeared about labor relations under genocide, everyday life under oppression, and the role of rescuers. The correspondence between the Holocaust and Argentina's disappearances disclosed neglected remembrances and exposed new perpetrators. There were also effects on the sites of memory. The Truth Commission had in 1984 described the places where the disappearance were kept as clandestine detention centres. By 2007, the human rights organisations preferred the term clandestine detention, torture and extermination centres, which were also identified as genuine concentration camps. A cosmopolitan mode of remembering had entered Argentine memory politics. The ongoing trials against military officers hardens the public confrontations between the human rights movement and the military and their sympathizers. Human rights lawyers stated that, were, that they were pursuing a collective conviction of the armed forces for genocide, resembling the blanket sentence of the SS and the Gestapo at the Nuremberg trial as criminal organizations. Furthermore, the genocide discourse raised questions about Argentina's collective responsibility for the political violence. 
Like in the case of crimes against humanity, guilt cannot be apportioned into circumscribed individual responsibilities and legal liabilities in the case of genocide because of the moral magnitude and complexity of this crime of crimes. Also, genocide is directed towards groups while crime against, crimes against humanity are aimed at individuals. The category shift from state terrorism to genocide was casting collective responsibilities on Argentine society. The substitution of collective for individual guilt diluted the legal complicity of civilians with the dictatorship into a moral collective guilt. Broad layers of the middle class had supported the coup d'etat of March 1976, and many Argentines had remained silent about the disappearances. The punishment of individual perpetrators did therefore no longer measure up to the infinity of the crime because, as Ricoeur has observed, a quote, there is no punishment appropriate for a disproportionate crime. In this sense, a crime of this sort constitutes a de facto instance of the unforgivable. End of quote. And here, agonistic memory becomes relevant because genocide attributes a collective guilt that can only be expiated by denouncing, punishing, and remembering the crime. Remembering in all its complexity and polyphony is a way in which people can make amends for the irreparable wrongs inflicted by remembering the disappeared and passing this collective memory to future generations. Agonistic memory would then be the proper mode of remembering that would bring Argentine society together, just as it is supposed to do so for a divided Europe, by stimulating even-handed museum, museum exhibits, holding reconciliatory commemorations, writing historical analyses that incorporate multiple perspectives, and establishing dialogues between adversarial groups. I fear, however, that such social cohesion is unlikely to happen in Argentina. The hostility between young human rights activists and the young military sympathizers is only increasing as both are making politicized cosmopolitan claims that become expressed in one-sided publications, magazines, websites, and commemorations about the political violence of the 1970s. Such politicized cosmopolitan memories seem also to be developing in Europe as well, if we witness the increasing violent confrontations between neo-fascists and anti-fascists and between neo-nationalists and neo-idealists idealists in Germany. The reason for all this is that these confrontations manifest the inability to mourn losses that are regarded as unacceptable. Mourning is, according to Freud, a confrontation with the reality of loss. The success of working through the loss and accepting the reality of the day is how that loss is remembered. When one defines the tens of thousands of disappearances in Argentina as a necessary price for protecting democracy, as the military believe, or as a sacrifice for making a social re revolution, as the former guerrilla insurgents believe, then these losses are easier to accept and to mourn than when they are regarded as genocide. The killing of people for who they are becomes an unresolvable and existentially disturbing loss. And so is the loss experienced by European neo-nationalists. When both losses are experienced as irre 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 irreparable losses, because the loss of national identity implies for neo-nationalists the destruction of who they are as a people, and genocide reveals the shocking realization that fellow human beings can commit evil deeds, that the consequences are dire because such losses are extended to those kindred in spirit and suffering and cannot be overcome without relinquishing one's collective identity. Agonistic memory will only work when antagonistic memory has not yet reached a level of enmity that will lead to a politicized cosmopolitan memory. The reason is that politicized cosmopolitan memory draws upon transnational forces and musters partisan universal solidarities that are entrenched in hostile relations and memories.
Okay, I greatly enjoyed all three papers and uh, um, it's difficult to uh, say enough in, in a big given five minutes, so I, I can only make a very few comments. I will start commenting on the last and then walk backwards. So in terms of the last paper, it seems to me that it uh, uh, reiterates what we had already defined and discussed yesterday, except that yesterday it was defined as uh, antagonism in disguise. And what we have here is it's called politicized cosmopolitanism, but it seems yet an another example of uh, antagonism disguised as cosmopolitanism. Now, I know very well that we perhaps ought to qualify this and talk about pseudo cosmopolitanism, uh, but nonetheless, uh, this uh, memory um, mode uh, appear to borrow uh, quite successfully um, many of the traits of cosmopolitanism. And so this is yet another example of uh, uh, a kind of memory mode that we encounter in reality and that, as I said, borrow many of the traits of cosmopolitan memory and we have to deal with this situation in so many different realities. Um, in fact, in many ways, I had the impression that what the author called, what Tony Robbins called agonism, in fact, was a kind of ideal type cosmopolitanism that he was uh, contrasting with. <laughs> the cosmopolitan, the antagonism in disguise that, that uh, was, we uh, could witness in the Argentine situation. So what do we do when, when we have um, uh, this inability of, uh, uh, let's say, ideal type cosmopolitanism to influence society and reality, and we have actually, in reality, dealing with a completely different phenomenon? Okay, uh, moving on, I think in the same paper, uh, what I don't agree with is the fact that uh, Tony suggests that, in fact, uh, the um, uh, transition from a clear-cut antagonistic memory mode to antagonistic uh, mode in disguise um, as a kind of pseudo-cosmopolitanism, he argues that this represents a hardening of the memory rifts, a hardening of the social-political divide, and it actually represents um, a a step backward. Why does he argue this? Because he argues that um, with this transition to this new memory mode, the division between two social political and ideological communities is transformed into a clear cut division between two essentialist ethno national communities. And these new kind of identities are much more intractable uh, and, and treated as primordialist, which means that it is an all-out confrontation between enemies, each of which feels under Im immediate and imminent threat. So in this kind of situation, Tony argues that it is, it is an impossibility to try and introduce agonistic elements. And here is where I, I tend to disagree. I think it is too pessimistic on the one hand, and also it seems to imply somewhere uh, that uh, we should uh, simply give up uh, in, in, because we are faced with uh, essentialist identities. But actually these essentialist identities are constructed, as we know. They are socially and politically constructed. And if so, they can still be deconstructed, or at least we can still attempt to do so. Now how can we do so? How can we introduce elements of agonism into a situation in which you have a binary divide which looks intractable? And here I move to uh, Chris's uh, intervention which I found extremely useful because 
what he has been able to do in Northern Ireland, where you do still have a binary divide and a binary confrontation between two apparently essentialist communities, is to, in a sense, bypass or attempt to bypass that direct confrontation by going back to 1968. Now, going back to 1968 in Northern Ireland means two things. It means that you go back to a period that precedes the troubles and nonetheless is not presented as a harmonious period uh, which was devoid of conflict. On the contrary, it was a period which was very conflictual, but where conflict was not expressed in violent terms. So you do not put conflict aside, you do not conceive reconciliation as uh, attempting to erase conflict, but you go back to a period in which, in fact, conflict was not simply between uh, uh, two essentialist communities, uh, but it was a multiple uh, uh, and um, multifaceted conflict where uh, many issues and is uh, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, minor and, and variety of conflict could come to the fore. And so, for instance, uh, uh, civil rights, human rights, women's issues, generational issues, uh, social and uh, uh, class issues, and, and so on and so forth. So you complicate the picture of the binary divide by addressing a variety of conflicts. And in doing so, you can then attempt successfully, from what we've heard, attempt a radical multi-perspectivity. And here I'd like to go back to what Astrid was saying yesterday, and she was talking about translating, how do you translate agonies which can be relatively easily uh, uh, achieved in art or in literature maybe, how do you translate it into different domains? It's, and, and it was almost suggesting that it was really very difficult, too difficult perhaps to do in museums. But here we have an example of how you can do it in museums. You can do it not just not simply through art installations, but through history and by using oral history. Now, Chris and I are in the process of writing an article on this, and, and we have been examining uses of oral history in museums. And what we find very often is that all museums nowadays use oral history. In almost every museum you can find, you can listen to individual stories or even you can listen to them and, 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 and look at people uh, uh, telling their stories. And this is also a, a, a very much an attempt to introduce multi-perspectivity. But in most museums we find example of consensual perspectivity. That is to say oral history is used to introduce multi perspectives in the sense of gender perspectives, generational perspectives, uh, etc. But within a, 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 you, you, a single overarching narrative. So oral history is not used in a radical way uh, to, to uh, really portray and display contrasting narratives. So that is the novelty, I think, of, of what uh, uh, Chris and, and, of course, uh, the, the curator of the museum, and we must not forget that it was a, collabor a collaboration, that is what they, they have been doing, and, and that, I think, is a very fruitful way of attempting uh, uh, to introduce agonism in museum, history museums, war museums especially. Um, and then moving uh, uh, finally on to Simon's contribution, I, I think that was that is very important because um, uh, Hans mentioned yesterday in his presentation that uh, um, we should not uh, we should we should distinguish between uh, single agonistic interventions and. Uh, um, uh, 
an agonistic discourse or perhaps an agonistic dialogue. Now, Simon gave an example uh, to, at the end of what could be taken as an agonistic intervention um, in, in the refurbishment of the, uh, uh, um, of the, of the youth, uh, uh, fascist youth uh, um, building. Um, but in fact, what he does is that he has created a kind of itinerary um, or we could talk, uh, we could uh, uh, consider it uh, a guided tour, or we could uh, use the term uh, walking tour, and and that takes in different sites. So this brings to me t to something that uh, again uh, Hans mentioned yesterday, which is um, uh, there has been recently this controversy over many uh, over statues. What to do with statues of perpetrators? Should we um, destroy them, or should we modify them in, with the kind of agonistic interventions? And Steam has argued that uh, it shouldn't be an either-or situation. We should perhaps uh, destroy some of them, we should modify others, we should uh, establish museums near the sites of these uh, statues and other monuments to perpetrators, uh, where a, a much more uh, 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 comprehensive discourse can be can be attempted. So seen in this light, I think what Simon is trying to do is another kind of agonistic intervention in which you take groups of people to visit different sites. Some of them, them have been modified uh, in, uh, with a kind of agonistic intervention. Some are cosmo have, uh, predominantly a cosmopolitan mode of remembering. Others are unashamedly uh, antagonistic and they still uh, have uh, kept a kind of propagandist role for very undesirable regimes. But if you take them together and, and you use them to promote uh, an agonistic discussion, an agonistic dialogue among the participants, then you've done something which I think is you've used them collectively in an agonistic Man. That's all. Thank you. Well, good morning to, to everybody. I, I come here as a footnote to, to Annabelle <laughs> here, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to make just two, two brief points. One of these is connected to the paper presented by Nina Robin. It's more on the conceptual framework. <laughs> uh, and the other one uh, has to do with the implementation of agonism and basically the, how we can see agonism in action. And this would refer to the papers by Simon and, and Chris. And thank you, the three of you, and Nina Robin particularly, for the, for, the, for, the, for the papers. So I'm going to be talking from uh, the perspective of a social anthropology, as anthropologists, because I think well, we are very interdisciplinary, and, and, I, um, and, and, and I think that the, the, that the, the paper by Tony Robin, he's also an anthropologist. We've been working together. All his reflection comes out also of the study of exhumations in Argentina. So it's, uh, it's, it's I, I kind of understand it as a sequel to, to, the, to, to the three case studies that Maria and I and Admir Hugo are, have studied in terms of I mean Argentina, I mean um, Spain, Poland, Bosnia, and then Argentina. No? And the Argentina and uh, Anna pointed to, to that. No? It's also another case of um, antagonism in disguise as in the Polish case. But also when I was reading the paper. And I, I, I've read a lot of Tony's work. It's like, uh, well, this is the, the history of Spain. I mean, that's exactly what has happened in, in Spain. Even the timing of the downloading of the parachuting of cosmopolitanism in, um, in Argentina is only three years apart from the real parachuting of uh, the same uh, framework in, in Spain. And it's done by the same uh, political, I mean, for, by the same international actor, which is the judge, Baltasar Garzón. It's another, again, it's another. Uh, and trial within international law, 
that kind of lands, you know, this new vocabulary in a certain uh, in a certain historical context. Happened in Argentina three years later. It happened in Spain, and so for me, what's interesting about this, and I'm going back to what uh, Astrid was uh, mentioning uh, yesterday about the the connectedness of of, of these memory modes, about the multidirectionality, about the traveling and whatnot. We in in, in social anthropology we have this concept about uh, which I think is important, and, and it was pointed out yesterday when uh, we were asked to, to qualify you know, uh, what we talk about. No? We anthropologists usually are the quote people because we don't believe in concepts as such. We always kind of go back to, you know, what, what's the, the genealogy of this concept, what this is all about, and so we kind of quote, quote. No? So um, we have uh, now this, uh, in, within the anthropology of human rights, this very, very important process, uh, concept, which is like the vernacularization of, uh, of, the, of global discourses. So you have these abstract global discourses which kind of are very dynamic, are in transformation, and they have a lot of complex elements, but then when they land into a into specific uh, context, you know, they produce different kinds of effects. And Tony is, is showing us how an antagonistic, I mean, very clear way, in a very clear way, how an antagonistic frame can go into this kind of, uh, two, uh, into two politicized cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan frames. So this is cosmopolitan pluralism, and the way it happens in Argentina. You know, I think it's a, it's a lesson we, we, should, we should use. Also, uh, you know the way in which these vocabularies have been adopted. No, how suddenly you know uh, uh, the, the, the concentration camps are linked to the to the Holocaust. And the phone, uh, mobile phone. Okay, so and uh, I, I wanted to refer to this work by uh, by. Um, Nathan Schneider and uh, Alex Bayer, they just wrote a book on the, on the, on the, on the ethics of never again, uh, which they used the, uh, one case from Eastern Europe, Spain, and Argentina also. So this is something that has been, you know, there's a lot of work being done on, on, on this, and how this vocabulary is kind of captured imagination, and particularly, and, and, and uh, Stefan was referring to this, how social movements strategically mobilize you know, their own uh, memory politics using, reusing, reframing, and transforming, and, and remaking these, these, uh, these uh, um, vocabularies which are, which are basically out there. And I, use, I have used the concept of downloading, and it's not just a, a metaphor, it's downloading, click. You click and you get, you know, this international convention, and you read it, and you do whatever with it. So this is really something that is happening on a, on a very, very, very dynamic, uh, dynamic way, you know? So, uh, um, other, other point that I think uh, um, Tony makes, just to finish with this part, is uh, that actually he, he points at, in, in, at some point in his paper, he talks about um, Argentinian academics providing conceptual uh, grounds for at least one of the, of the politicized cosmopolitanisms. And I think this is very important because it appeals to us. No? Yesterday I had a discussion with Wolf Steiner about, you know, I'm not a native speaker, so I, I, would, I, I would tell him, well, self-reflection is not like a redundancy. You know, you have reflection and then self-reflection. And we were talking about this, and he said, no, because we also have to think about the way in which we can may contribute, you know, to, to consolidate uh, as, as, as public scholars, you know, as, as uh, and this, 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 this whole debate about the public scholarship, I think, is, is very, very important. And yesterday, the police, the, and the policy officer from the EU also mentioned you know, this, this, this crucial importance. No? So I just wanted to, to point out that uh, we haven't discussed much about that, but Tony kind of drops it there. Like, uh, you know, the academics also, you know, participating in this is not that we are outside, but we kind of, with our own analysis and our own reflections, are contributing to circulating and, and making these uh, concepts and travel. And travel no? So this, for the, in, in, in relationship to the conceptual framework, in terms of the, of the second point I want to make in terms of implementation and agonism in action, uh, I, I found both, uh, both uh, presentations uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, just to start with, with, with Simon, it's like, uh, um, you know, we have agonism out there. It's just a matter of uh, creating or constructing relevant, informed, uh, juxtapositions. Yeah. You have these, these places of memory are there. You have to intervene in them. I mean, you don't, you don't need to create anything anew. You just go there and, and go in the, in the same day, go to, 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 to Mussolini's tomb in Predapio, and you go to this, uh, to this museum, and then the, 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 the agonies. I mean, this has to be well designed, but 
out there. We have, we have the materials to do, we have the monuments, we have the memory places to kind of, of produce agonism without inventing, you know, uh, things uh, anew. So I, I found this very, very interesting, you know, the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, his, his approach about also Mussolini's Rome and, and, uh, and uh, the way in which you, you, you deal with your students. No? So in terms of education, in terms of the pedagogies in which, uh, in which we can uh, convey these this, this, uh, this new approaches, I found it absolutely fascinating. No? And then uh, I'll, I'll go uh, a little, I'll, I'll say something a, little, a bit a little later about uh, Mussolini's tomb, no? but I just wanted to 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 to, to say something about uh, about uh, all of, um, and the, the project by by Chris, which I find uh, fascinating, and uh, and uh, actually. Um, uh, it's 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 happening in other in other places. No, and I, uh, we briefly talked about this uh, yesterday, and I just wanted to mention here that, for example, uh, in the in the in, in the Basque country, in terms again of informed juxtapositions, and you've, you've talked about how you do it and it's very conceptualized. It's not just juxtaposing for the sake of juxtaposing. It's just doing it in the right way or in a in a challenging way. No, so uh, there is this uh, this project, and Maria and I uh, were asked to write a report on memory politics by the Basque Parliament. And so we visited the Basque country, we talked to all the political parties, and we were brought to this, uh, I don't know how to call it, it's like a tent. And in this tent, you have, a, they have a big problem in the Basque country, and, it's, and so I connected this with you because also they kind of um, externalize, in a, sense, in a way, the big problem, which is ETA and, uh, and, and Basque terrorism. So they have created these two categories, which is also like what you've done, 1968 and the troubles. So they have historical memory which is very complex in the rest of Spain, but in the Basque country, everybody agrees that that should be dealt with, because they have another bigger problem, which is how to deal with, uh, with recent, and they call it the memory of the, of the, of the contemporary. You know? So this is the ETA thing. You know? So what they have done is like, you get into this big tent, and you have like three small tents, and you go down, and it's oral history. And what, uh, basically, you just sit there, and you listen to testimonies, but you don't know the origin of the voice. You see people talking. And then you can empathize with them. And it's only later when this is a, a, a victim of torture. This is a victim of eta terrorism. And then you start to reconstruct yourself after these uh, testimonies have been you know, given to you in a raw kind of fashion. No? And there are like three different capsules. And you move from one to the other. And at the end, you get a very, very, a very uh, agonistic kind of uh, perspective. Again, this is, as we have discussed many times during this conference, the, the purpose is overly uh, cosmopolitan. It's 100% cosmopolitan. Human rights, victims, blah, blah. But then the agonistic intervention can come on top of it. And I think this is, this is something that you may be interested in, in, in pursuing. You know? So this is what Gogora, the Basque, the Basque Memory Association institution, is, is doing. No? And then I, I wanted to say something also about the 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 end uh, the, the, the the very end of what you uh, you were saying no it's like the digital uh, the digital uh, um, manifestation so so to speak of, of your project no because I think that's uh, really important and we have seen for example uh, Gulf Castaner said you know the the museum setting kind of put some constraints into the way in which we, uh, we wanted to do this agonism that, uh, so maybe we should, if we want to promote agonism, we should use new media, not kind of, um, kind of uh, deal with media that have been already uh, colonized, you know, by cosmopolitanism or by antagonism, just use new media, no? I'm, I'm very much in for that. And, and uh, do we have a debate in Spain about what to do with, uh, with the Valley of the Fallen, for example? So uh, we, you, have, you have this, I don't know if you've, you know what the Valley of the Fallen is. This is a huge uh, monument with a cross, and uh, there are like 30,000 bodies around, you know, the, the you, you have the central, I mean, the Basilica, and there's Adeli Mas, and you have Francisco Franco buried on one side, and the founder of the fastest party on the other side. And this place is not just a touristic place. It's, it's activated on a daily basis. It, it belongs to national patrimony and whatnot. So nobody really knows what to do with it. For one thing, 
we have, uh, there is a, um, a big debate on how, what to do with Franco's body. And I, when I, you were showing this, idea, this thing about uh, uh, Mussolini's tomb, is basically these highly politically charged bodies, how to deal with them. So now in Spain, the exhumations which started being fo focused, fo I mean, its initial, the initial focus were, you know, exhume, you know, trade unionists and uh, peasants in the, in the villages. The whole movement has gone, has grown, you know. Uh, has outgrown itself and now is challenging the honorary burials of the military coup generals. So some of them have been already unburied. And uh, Franco, now that we have a huge controversy on how to deal with Franco's, Franco's body. But at, at the same time, when we uh, discuss, and going back to, to Chris, when we, when, uh, so bodies is also, it's, it's, very in, it's, it's very important in terms of also, also producing agonism. So we, 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 it's just a suggestion for, for debate. And then uh, going back to Chris, uh, we have this, um, uh, this debate about what to do with the value of the following. Should it be transformed into um, um, a reconciliation place? That's kind of out of the picture, I think, at this point. No? So we are, we are proposing, me and some other people, and there was a, a meeting in Madrid, in Media Lab, in a, in a tech, high tech kind of place, no? a laboratory of ideas, no? about what to, to, to do with it. So we came up with this, uh, this notion that, uh, you know, the value of the fallen basically is totalitarian memory in stone, carved in stone. It's, 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 it's massive, you know, totalitarian, neo, neo, in, in the neo, uh, national Catholic kind of brand, Spanish brand of totalitarianism. And so we, did, we, we thought that the, the way in which we could wrap the monument into an, another discourse to produce this kind of agonistic effect is to, to, to equate um, totalitarian memory with stone and democratic memory with pixels. And so basically, this is what, what, we think, what I think that uh, we, we, we can make use, informed use, careful use of these uh, new technologies to kind of provide this multi-perspectivism that uh, that you are producing in your own in, in your own uh, in, in your own uh, exhibit. So if you just and also thinking about new generations, you know, if they can go with their mobile phones and they can watch Franco's inauguration speech, it's, I mean you don't have to say anything. The question is, is this reconciliation? No, because obviously it was a very partisan, neo -fa I mean fascist uh, uh, discourse, but you can have it. I mean, it's, it's just history. It's, you don't have to manipulate it at all. Just, just click. But then you have the burial of Franco in 1975. You have many, many different materials and people with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with, 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 I mean, with, with smartphones or, or, or tablets, they can access, you know, and they, ha they can have a, an, 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 an agonistic reading of the monument. So in, in this sense, I, 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 I wonder that if we find that some of the, of the means uh, uh, in terms of art, in terms of exhibits, in terms of uh, theory, uh, we, we find limits in what we have. We should go for the for the digital. I will propose the notion of digital agonism, and that's uh, the end of it. Yeah. So not everybody's back in the room, but we are quite behind time already. So I'm going to suggest that we start, and by starting, hopefully that will encourage people to return to their seats. Um, so we have two contributions now um, from colleagues. Um, from two other Horizon 2020 projects working in the fields of, of memory and culture, Cohere and Traces, uh, which I guess are kind of uh, sister projects, uh, which makes um, Unrest a kind of a cousin, I think, because um, Traces and Cohere have been uh, extremely generous in, in working with us and engaging with us and inviting us to their events. So it's particularly good uh, to have two representatives of those projects now coming and speaking at our uh, final conference. So we're starting with uh, Susanna Eckersley and I'll hand straight over to her. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. Um, as David said, Cohere is uh, in some ways a, a project that, you know, a family project with, um, with unrest and also with traces funded um, within different strands of the same uh, thematic call uh, in the Reflective Societies program in Horizon 2020 um, and running at approximately the same kind of time period as well. So it's great to be here to share some of the, um, some of the work that we've been doing in Cohere with you today. 
So Cohere is structured in a, a somewhat different way um, to Unrest in that it's a very broad project, a very open project, um, and one which has had a, a, you know, a focus on many different things at the same time. The, kind of the, the thread that is um, drawing them all together is the idea of European identities um, and heritages um, used very much in the sense of plural heritages, um, which you can see um, on the slide that I'm just showing you now. Um, this material is on our website, so if you want to look at it in, in more detail with a little bit more time, then please um, take a look at the project website um, to do so. So we've, we've worked on the basis of heritage or heritages as our frame rather than necessarily memory as such. But in many ways, you could see both of these two terms as either moving closer together um, within current research um, and practice, or as in some, to some people would see them as inter interchangeable in some uh, respects of, of work that is being undertaken. The project is um, divided into six research work packages, and I'm just showing them to you here just as a, a way for you to see just how diverse um, the type of uh, subject matter is that we're dealing with within this single project of Cohere, so we don't have a, um, a sort of overall idea of a particular theory or a particular approach, but actually it's much more around the multiplicity and diversity of different aspects of heritages, memories, identities um, within and connected to Europe. Um, and different disciplinary approaches to that as well. So we are a project which consists of museum and heritage studies, scholars, historians, political scientists, education specialists, digital interaction specialists, um, ethnomusicologists, and European ethnologists, anthropologists, um, and I will have forgotten some, but you can get a feel for the, um, the range of different disciplines and approaches that are coming into this project. So what I wanted to focus on really um, this morning for you in, to think about in relation to your ideas of agonism and some of, the, um, you know, some of the kind of discussions that have been happening over the last day and a bit was to look at some research which I undertook um, partly within Work Package 1 but also connecting to Work Package 2, um, thinking about the uses of the past in political discourse. Um, and although it says the representation of Islam in European museums, it's very much more about um, wider thinking about diversity in European museums that might be about Islam or post-colonialism, migration, refugees, and so on. So it is a little wider still than even this uh, description suggests. So the, the research that I'm going to present to you in a little bit more detail today although at the same time as saying it's in more detail, this is a very compressed summary of a chapter that I've written recently and which will be published later this year, um, and which Wolf and Hans have had access to the full chapter of, so I'm just giving you a summary of that. And I'm very aware in summarizing what is an incredibly complex topic um, that there may be some simplica simplification um, that you may feel in the presentation, which I don't think, or I hope is not, there in the written version, in the full version. So forgive me if things appear simple when actually they're incredibly complicated. So I'm looking at the um, anniversary of the firebombing of Dresden that happened on the 13th of February 1945. Um, and I took an approach of looking at multiple different sites and venues for my field work, going beyond my normal kind of um, sites of museums, um, heritage sites, commemorative sites to look at, um, in addition to contemporary protest activity that was happening all within the space of one week um, in February last year in Dresden. In fact, we're actually you know, at the anniversary week now again. Um, so my field work started on the 8th of February 2018 and ran for a week. Um, you can see on the slide the methods that I've been employing. Um, I worked with a filmmaker who accompanied me um, on my research trip and did some filmmaking that's part of a documentary film that is one of the major outputs of Cohere, um, which will hopefully be publicly available in the next few months. Um, and I've been using a number of different kind of theoretical approaches, trying to pull different things together, thinking about the complexity, as I say, of this issue um, and of all the different kinds of acts and um, processes of memory performance and memory making um, and, you know, working through memory within Dresden. <clears throat> so, 
But what we see, and as I say, I looked very much at the, so we'll have a more focus on the protest activity in this presentation than on the museums, because we've heard a lot about museums already. We see very much from both the left wing and the right wing, protests, counter protests, um, demonstrations, um, civil society interventions within the city space, that the Holocaust is being used as a frame by both the left and right um, in order to kind of give a particular sense towards their narrative of, and their uh, presentation of themselves in relation to the past. So we see the left wing. Um, taking very much a perpetrator narrative, seeing themselves as the um, descendants of perpetrators and implicit within the German complicity and perpetration. So civic initiatives and left-wing protest and counter-protest against the right-wing all focus very much on the Holocaust as a context for the firebombing as the, in the historical context and are an attempt to um, deflect attention away from the idea of Germans as victims um, within World War II, which we see presented um, by the right wing, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, the, I just want to say the banner on the left-hand side on the floor says, Wo wart ihr am 27. Januar? So where were you on the 27th of January, which is, of course, Holocaust Memorial Day? So, um, and then the, the words on the other ones are very much about perpetration and German perpetrators. From the right wing, we see them adopting in the same way, appropriating Holocaust narratives um, in order to present themselves as victims, um, focusing on the deaths of Germans um, during the firebombing and the, the supposed innocence of the dead and of the city as a whole, which has, as we know, uh, been contested and um, shown to be inaccurate. They use terms in their banners, which again, you might be able to see, such as the Bomben Holocaust, um, and they present inflated numbers of the dead from the Dresden firebombings, both to relativize the Holocaust, but also to attempt to position German, the German victim narrative at the center of this presentation of the past. So moving forward from this, we can also see a, a kind of a reappropriation of the past again, a second layer of appropriation, where the past is transposed into the present, onto contemporary political and social circumstances. This is a still from the, the Dresden film that uh, my colleague Ian MacDonald made. So here you, you'll see both left and, and right wing again transposing their self-identities of either being victims or perpetrators onto the contemporary political and social issue, primarily migration and refugees. So within the right wing, um, who you see here in AfD um, march through the city, and then on, on the left side of that is the AfD uh, processing towards a commemoration, official city commemoration of the Dresden firebombing uh, with memorials and speeches and so on. You see within the right wing the narrative of victimhood transposed onto what Ruth Wodak has described as a politics of fear around Muslims in Germany today, the presence of refugees as a perceived threat to public safety. And then in the left wing, again we see this same narrat their narrative of perpetration again being transposed into the pr present context of migration and um, connected to a discourse of the culture of welcome. So the idea of diversity and inclusivity within the left-wing uh, protesters, based very much on what I would call a politics of shame and pity, which is, has some relationship to, but I believe is different to, Jeffrey Olick's idea of a politics of regret, um, perhaps partly due to the generational changes and the developing processes of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, or coming to terms with getting over the past within German society um, in a wider context rather than just the Dresden context. <coughs> So if you can see, um, the girl on the right hand side there has got a refugee's welcome flag draped around her. So the third layer then, um, so we've had the two layers, the appropriation of the Holocaust as a frame, the transposition of the victim and perpetrator narratives into the present in relation to migration. And now we have a, an additional layer to what's happening within the city um, that focuses very much on a sort of layer of, of behavior, of performed and enacted behaviors within the public space, and a perception of that behavior, of what it might mean or what it's perceived to mean. 
And I think this is part of a strategic and selective positioning of the political actors involved. Um, so here you can see um, the members of a right-wing Burschenschaft, which is a student fraternity, which are historically um, considered to be very right-wing. And I know that this particular one is still considered to be very right-wing today. Um, and also the RFD protesters, neo-Nazi protesters who um, were at the march that I witnessed, and NPD, so National Party of Germany, um, activists who were involved in the commemoration ceremonies and wreath-laying, taking on what um, Ruth Wodak has described as a, a governmental habitus rather than a, um, an oppositional habitus, which is what they previously would have had, as a sort of a strategy in order to try and gain social acceptance. So this is um, framed very much within behavior of um, supposed respectable behavior, pe behavior that might be perceived as being rational, rational, calm, and appropriate as a form of um, mourning and remembrance. Um, and this is very much in contrast to the underlying messages of exclusion, hate, and so on that, that are there. So they're, they're almost trying to hide um, their their political leanings by presenting themselves in a way that is more acceptable socially. The left wing, on the other hand, and in particular here again from the film, um, you can see on the left-hand side the left wing counter-protesters who were protesting against the RFD on the right-hand side, um, commemorating the German dead of Dresden within the same space of the city on the evening of the 13th of February. So the left-wing counter-protesters used the tactics of disruption while presenting themselves as, as being part of a discourse of peace and welcome. So this apparent contradiction between their behavior, which is very emotional, noisy, disruptive, um, inappropriate, um, and the, the, the discourses that they're, the messages that they're trying to present is also interesting in the same way as it was with the right-wing. So they, they use a sort of physical disruption, noise disruption, uh, within this space to, to disrupt the RFD commemoration. As I say, being perceived as emotional, inappropriate, and disrespectful, and thereby undermining their messages of uh, diversity, inclusion, and welcome. So within the space, and here you have um, some of the civic society sort of, of more, perhaps more measured responses to it. Um, the two museums that I looked at, the City Museum on the top left and the uh, Military History Museum on the, to on the bottom left, um, a human chain around the city earlier in the evening, and then a candlelit uh, silent moments while the bells of the Frauenkirche ring at the end of the evening. Um, so what we see in the city during this week is that um, these two kind of issues of appropriation and appropriateness are being played out in multiple forms with the use of past narratives being then transposed into the present while the appropriateness of behavior becomes the predomin predominant means by which different groups within this um, commemorative protest um, situation are being perceived and judged by other members of society. It's interesting to note, I think, and this is probably the, the only thing I'll say about the museums at this point, that the museums themselves attempt to, and consciously attempt to present a much more fact-based um, approach to this history with the context um, and facts in a very unemotional, somewhat detached but not neutral way um, as a counter discourse to these very emotive and emotional practices within um, the public kind of um, commemoration or the, the commemoration within the city and the protests. So I've run through quite a complex situation rather quickly, so I hope that it, it makes sense for you. But I wanted to think about this for a moment at the end in relation to some of the things about memory um, that we've been talking about. And it struck me that um, if we look at Alida Asman's guidelines, which I know are from 2007, so from a, a different time to now, we could look at these and think, you know, these are her guidelines for suggesting how um, collect, the use of collective memories can be done in a constructive and um, positive, progressive um, way for the good of all. But actually, you could see that the right wing in particular are using perhaps these same strategies 
to position themselves within the memory discourses, within the public space, and within the perception of the public as being the ones who are being the more rational um, and taking control of the memory discourses within Dresden. Um, and linking again to the ideas of agonism that have been debated quite hotly yesterday and today, one of the points that I wanted to make was that one of the challenges, I think, for agonistic memory as an idea is that while I think many of us would say, yes, the, the, uh, the need for dialogue is urgent and the, um, the benefit of it can be seen clearly, um, the problem is that the potential for dialogue between such opposing groups only exists if both groups or all groups, if there are multiple ones, wish to have dialogue and agree to participate. Um, you know, I know that museums are seeing themselves as a, playing a role in that, but perhaps they're more um, an intermediary rather than it's not really a dialogue between the opposing voices. It's a, a presentation of the opposing voices to a public um, as an intermediary rather than a direct dialogue. So to come back at the end to the project, um, so this is what, as I said, this is one of, the, one of the areas of research within this very big, very broad project that has looked at all sorts of different things. Um, and I've just, so I've just presented one small snippet of that to you. If you're interested to find out more, do have a look at these. Um, the website has information about the project. The critical archive um, has lots of free materials, working papers, um, some some interactive educational games, um, some film footage, and so on. Um, we have a book series uh, with Routledge as part of the project. One of the books is already on the list there as being published this month, and there'll be another five books coming out within the year, so um, quite a lot of material um, for people to get to grips with. Um, the trailer of the film is available at that link, and once the full film is um, available publicly, you'll probably be able to get to it through that link as well. And we also had a, an artistic production of a folk oratorio um, by the ethnomusicologists and conductor within the project, which you can also see a, a short film of there. So I've gone around from the big project into the detail of a really complicated, layered um, part of the research and try to come back to the breadth of it again for you um, here. So I hope, I hope that this has been interesting and thank you very much for your time. So good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting Traces. I'm representing here to give uh, its contribution uh, about uh, this topic of agonistic memories. Uh, uh, even though I'm not sure to be able to express a clear position in this regard, I mean, I know uh, the research project quite well because besides being uh, uh, the, the dissemination manager, I also participated uh, in the theoretical investigation about artistic co-production uh, and uh, as exhibition designer, I have uh, coordinated uh, the co-production of uh, Tracy's uh, major exhibition. But the point is that uh, uh, probably the, this issue has not been framed in a clear uh, way from a theoretical point of view. And probably this is because uh, within traces, instead of building uh, a theoretical framework and uh, trying to apply uh, to uh, different uh, practices, we actually started from practices, uh, from artistic practices, uh, and uh, tried to understand uh, what was working and or not. So for this reason today, I will present you uh, the general framework to sum up uh, uh, the content of the presentation, uh, to give you an idea about the structure of the project, uh, the research fields to illustrate the activities, and I will present you, I will focus on a single line of research to make a specific example of investigation on the topic of contentious memory, social co cohesion, and the role of the arts 
that yesterday we started to highlight and to frame some way. Sorry. Okay, you can read here the abstract trace is started in 2016 with uh, a simple acknowledgement that European cultural heritage is uh, inherently complex and that in the past uh, those conflicting perspectives on different historical memories have been colliding, uh, partially preventing the construction of a European identity that could be open and inclusive. Thus at the basis of the project there were the belief that if transmitted uh, sensitively these contentious heritages could contribute to a process of reflexive Europeanization in which the European imagination could be shaped by a dialogue, as also Susanna was saying, uh, across different positions. And for this reason, Traces involved a multidisciplinary team that brought together uh, established and emerging scholars, but um, mostly artists and cultural workers, to develop an investigation on uh, contentious cultural heritage by working on uh, specific case studies. And these case studies, which were the core of the research and the subject of the theoretical investigation, were initiated by traces in a specific form that is uh, a specific, specific format uh, that is the one of creative co-production uh, in which artists uh, but also researchers, uh, heritage agencies and stakeholders collaborated on long-term projects uh, research, uh, researching selected case, cases of contentious heritage. In uh, uh, these three years we had uh, five of them covering a wide range of heritage and also, let's say, a wide range of contentiousness. Uh, I briefly show you the different projects because it, it's very difficult to uh, make a general framework of this project uh, since it is so specific in the case studies. The first one, uh, that is absence as heritage, explored the built heritage of an abandoned synagogue uh, in Romania and uh, the documentary heritage of the archives here, library and other objects of the Jewish community that disappeared uh, during the 50s and the 60s with no trauma uh, by developing uh, particip participatory art projects and exhibition materials uh, like uh, workshops, summer camps and other activities aimed at encouraging the local population to engage with uh, uh, this Jewish history and the role in this uh, community. A similar focus uh, marked also awkward objects of genocide, that is a project that entailed the uh, identification, the documentation, and then also the, the presentation and the confrontation regarding uh, uh, the overlooked domain uh, of Holocaust representation that emerged outside of established center of uh, artistic production by self-taught local practitioner, vernacular art. Another topic, strange one, quite strange one, uh, for uh, uh, this casting of death project, which was the first systematic research on the topic of death masks in Slovenia, during which the research team collected data on more than 100 mask that must, and published them in a database that was the real core of the research because it produced a series of platforms open to the public like a blog and open access online database, a public press conference and a research exhibition that were both structured and used as a conventional format uh, but remained also open as they constituted the research itself. Then in CCP4, so the co-production uh, uh, created co-production for that was uh, Dead Images, uh, we initiated a critical public discussion about the collection of human remains kept in European institutions by developing methods to encourage uh, processes of change uh, within those institutions. And uh, the team uh, that was formed by artists, uh, curators and ethnographers uh, and also by me as a designer, uh, worked on a display system that was presented for the first time in Edinburgh, aimed uh, at uh, reconstructing a sort of personal memory of the skulls kept, uh, in this case, in uh, Vienna Natural History Museum. Finally, <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, the last CCP, CCP5, worked on transforming and transmitting the multi-perspective memory of a former political prison in Northern Ireland, that is Longcash Maze, by employing three principal dialogical methods for working with a diverse range of participants who had uh, first and experience of the prison, so restaging the uh, uh, the experience of being there and so reappropriating and re by retelling the memories of this uh, uh, of this prison but beyond ideologically determined narratives so then besides ccps with interests we had theoretical investigation from different research fields that supported and complemented these art-based research actions, uh, analyzing and expanding their outcomes uh, that were organized into five main research strands and five main uh, groups of the research. Uh, you, have, you can see here the list, uh, uh, the first one uh, that was about creative co-production. With uh, which I uh, worked, uh, analyzed and developed participatory methods and models uh, related to innovative contemporary creative collaboration. So, in order to um, promote uh, relevant strategies for uh, citizens' involvement, the second one examined the collaborative process between art and research, particularly in relation to challenges posed uh, by the post colonial legacy of museum collections. The third one, uh, about education and stakeholder involvement, uh, investigated learning and exhibiting contentious cultural heritage in Europe in order to identify uh, the ways in which educational setting could provide space of conflict but also of negotiation. And uh, performing heritage, uh, uh, as the title says, conducted ethnographic uh, fieldwork uh, with uh, a specific focus on uh, intangible heritage and expressive heritage practices. And the last one <coughs> that was about contentious collections undertook comparative uh, uh, analysis in order to identify new ways of mediating difficult collections. So the general framework uh, is very heterogeneous, uh, has been very heterogeneous, was very heterogeneous, uh, and in some way difficult to, to manage. But the point is that those groups uh, started, uh, started from uh, the creative co-productions initiated by Traces uh, and then highlighted some specific themes and methodologies uh, that were transferred and used in other and different cases of contentious heritages. For instance, within the first research trend, one of the privileged focus of the investigation in relation with contentious memories and the reflexive process of Europeanization was represented by the process of production of an open and inclusive public space. Uh, because we saw public space uh, as the arenas in which key cultural interactions and societal dynamics took place, uh, I mean in which people could recognize themselves as a public, but in the same time uh, where the specificity and difference can be maintained and asserted uh, in productive ways. Uh, in this regard, in order to highlight the essential social value of public space construction, we particularly focused on those countries that were still at the margins of the Europeanization, uh, Europeanization process, at least from a political point of view. So where participation in these actions seemed to be stronger, because here top-down actions of urban design and management have partially receded to the, the public economic insufficiency, and in opposition, smaller catalysts like that uh, uh, have become a, a preferred model of intervention for public space building and, and activation in the form of everyday and bottom-up creative approaches to local problem uh, in order to reappropriate some way contemporary city public dimension. In 2008, for instance, uh, a group of young uh, artists supported by uh, the European Cultural Foundation pioneered uh, uh, an original intervention for the rehabilitation of this uh, neglected space uh, located uh, in front of Council Department of Culture of uh, Kishina, uh, the capital of Moldova. And um, everything started with uh, the idea of building here a new urban identity uh, for a civic area that was formerly dominated by the representation of power and marked by conflictual memories 
of the dictatorship, of course, and thus restoring the sense of a real public space that could be different from the one imposed by the central government. So the group studied a permanent installation meant to represent both the catalyst for artistic events of the city and the trigger for active processes of social engagement using the only typology of participated public space that could be recognized by citizens that was the domestic one. Because during Brezhnev's season, Moldova faced uh, the birth of the phenomenon of clandestine exhibition, which proliferated throughout Soviet Union until its fall. Because underground art uh, was uh, prohibited and prosecuted, and uh, artists resorted to showing in an informal network of, of private homes. But private homes were the tiny flat of uh, the regime. And uh, in this uh, sense, uh, the artist placed uh, as a kiosk in the corner of the square this replica of a functionalist apartment, which could be used uh, uh, for different activities, such as exhibition, debates, concerts, and projection. As if in this square that was historically dominated by the institutional propaganda, only the idea of home could restore a real public sphere that is quite uh, strange through this uh, act of spatial reappropriation. And from a certain point of view, I show you some images, and this case could be seen quite as a unique and peculiar event. However, in a wider perspective, it also represented the epitome of an emerging trend that is characterized characterizing the reconstruction of public sp spatial dimension of some of uh, uh, post-Soviet and post-socialist countries in a perspective of progressive Euro Europeanization that is marked by the attempt to enable and encourage people to reappropriate public space and creating a new sense of social identity and civil belongings. In a way, because uh, we know from uh, Lefebvre or Michel de Certeau or Mary Douglas study about home domesticity, but also an, an art, and that uh, domestic sphere is not only a spatial typology, but it is a very precise modality of territorial control, and domesticating an urban space means understanding it is a part of an action of personal resignification that is based on the, uh, the daily practices aimed at transforming the city into a familiar place. Then historically, urban design has never paid much attention to the idea of inhabitability of public spaces or their domestication. However, during the last 20 years, due to a strange semantic overlap, public space design has gradually started to interpret the city, domestication in this case, with a formal and functional repertoire that recalls uh, the architecture of a home. And whereas it's not difficult to find uh, more than one trace of this approach in some of the most important uh, projects of the last year, uh, this reference appears to be stronger when citizens, like in this case, are called to indicate their idea of public uh, in many contemporary interventions characterized by a very high rate of participation. Moreover, its strong political value is clearly visible in some interventions carried out in the context where the construction of a new public sphere, breaking a sort of forced collectivism, is experienced as a reconquest. It is the same spirit we have seen in Chisinau, but it's also the same spirit affecting this intervention that is all, uh, um, oh, oh, mo most radical, sorry. It is <laughs> also most radical in Bucharest uh, for, uh, that was implemented two years later for the rehabilitation of the whole district, not just a public art intervention, but the whole district that remained underdeveloped after the end of the regime. Uh, in 2010, a group of architects, artists, uh, local representatives launched this experiment to put an end to this uh, situation through a very delicate intervention of urban renovation that mainly consisted in a series of guidelines and a single color. The common purpose uh, was to create uh, a series of micro places capable of uh, subverting and giving a new meaning to the uniformity of uh, uh, totalitarian urbanism, so to the structure 
uh, of the city that was the reflection of the dictatorship. And it is significant that the whole operation passed through the construction of so-called urban living rooms, which finally defend a series of more controllable and differentiated areas. Each one defined by the equipment with which the inhabitants build this sort of new public spaces. Uh, once again, therefore, this uh, sense uh, of intimacy in public uh, was crucial to structure the format strategies aimed at encouraging different practices of spatial reappropriation. Because uh, the connoting power of domestic space is unquestionable, uh, because as in their, in their own spaces, people are free to create their own spaces. Uh, the same possibility is offered them outside. And uh, it has the merit, uh, this risk, of course, to deprive uh, a part of the civic value that uh, uh, is traditionally attributed to urban open spaces. But however, it has the merit of highlighting the need for a stronger sense of belonging that today the production of public space, uh, and i speaking of uh, physical but also discursive, discursive public space seems to require. And this, and this for this reason, that from a series of tactical interventions, this approach is now spreading among different strategic projects uh, from public art uh, to urban design. So to conclude, uh, I'm concluding. <laughs> I could have chosen uh, uh, other specific examples to illustrate the, the general idea of traces, uh, maybe focusing on uh, collections, contentious collections, or, or the exhibition we produced. Uh, but I think that this uh, specific strand uh, um, perfectly represents, in a physical way and uh, in a very plastic way, um, the way in which within traces uh, we try to deal with a, a contentious memory that cannot be simply erased from, pu from public discourse. This is public space, cannot be demolished, cannot be uh, changed. And um, I don't know if it, if it is agonistic, it is uh, surely counter-hegemonic, because uh, if we take for granted uh, Anna Arendt's, uh, from, um, from Anna Arendt to Nancy Fraser's idea about domesticity, domestic sphere is, o is always counter-hegemonic. Uh, but I know one thing. Yesterday, Hans, uh, quoting Anne Rigny, said that the arts uh, have the potential, can have the potential, of bringing into traditional narratives unfamiliar and different perspectives. <laughs> Within traces, uh, we try to demonstrate that arts and relational art have the potential of bringing into conflictual narratives different perspectives, but in a familiar way. Thank you. both presentations. Uh, we have enjoyed a lot uh, the collaboration with uh, both projects and we are very happy to have you here. Um, first, Susanna Eckersley's presentation of Cohere. Cohere is, as you say, a very broad project. It's very open and you have all these different dimensions and I am sweating thinking about how you would possibly hold them together because one of the problems as I see on the Andres pro uh, project is that we haven't had sufficient internal dialogue. And I think with a project that broad, <laughs> that must be really difficult. So um, please, if you could uh, give me some hints to uh, how you could possibly hold such a project together. Now to your case study, extremely interesting, I think. 
um, and, and courageous. I mean, your way of um, introducing new um, methodologies, your distinction between appropriation and appropriateness, I think that is very productive. You show the different, the two different, mainly the two different opposing uh, discourses towards uh, the memory in, in Dresden. And I would say, uh, one, they, they both use the terminology of the Holocaust uh, remembrance, so that's in itself very interesting. And one, I would say, the right-wing um, use is obviously the antagonism in disguise of, of the Holocaust memory. The other one, I, the left wing, which is also uh, related to the um, memory of, uh, or, or to the question of the migration and, and refugee crisis, is uh, more genuinely uh, cosmopolitan in many ways, but I agree with you, it's, it is different from um, Olix, for instance, uh, memory of, of regret. So, uh, what do we have here? Is that another uh, antagonism in disguise, or is it cosmopolitanism going antagonistic, which would be, uh, so to speak, an, an, another way to see it, which could be maybe related to what we have uh, seen in Spain. So that could be uh, one question. Um, a third comment on, on, uh, on that uh, case study would be your way of using, uh, as I also wrote to you, the, conce the, the concept of contextualization. Because as you say in, in the paper I, I uh, read, um, the left wing discourse is contextualizing uh, the firebombing, uh, putting it into relation to the Holocaust history, and thereby blaming morally the city as a whole, uh, and so to speak, legitimizing the bombings. Um, I would say, what is needed in, in, uh, in Dresden is not only a, an agonistic approach, as, as you say, putting into dialogue the two parties, and if they don't want a dialogue, there's no way of an agonism in there. I would say an, agonist, an agonistic approach here would be in the museums or in the memory work to ask why the city became a collaborator or a bystander, or even a perpetrator in the case of the Holocaust, because there are social, historical, cultural, etc., ways to contextualize that perpetration. And that, if, if, if I should generalize that, um, that point, I, I would say what Agonism or agonistic memory intends is to repoliticize the relation between the present and the past. But the way to do it is through the repoliticization of the past. So it is only through the repoliticization of the past we are able it, uh, actually to repoliticize the relation between present and past. So we, it would start with this contextualization of the authoritarian uh, movements in Germany uh, in the 30s. So that was my comment on, on, on the, very briefly on, on, on the COHERE project. Thank you also to Jacobo uh, for his presentation of traces. Um, you say the project started from the artistic practices, not from a theoretical uh, perspective, and that's completely different from the, from the Unrich, which is a concept-driven project. Anyway, I am very, very envious of um, the way you have put into focus the uh, practical collaboration between um, artists and uh, scholars. That would have um, been very important uh, experiences for unrest to have. I, I think we could have learned a lot about how to engage that collaboration. We could have had much more uh, productive outcomes if we had had some, some experiences uh, in that sense. Um, but given that, that way of approaching your resources, I, I would say, I, I would ask you, what are your findings in that sense? What are your findings on the study? I, I know you have anthropologists 
uh, working uh, on the study of that kind of collaboration. So what are your findings there? What, 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 what is the secret to make a productive um, uh, collaboration between academics and, and, and artists in, in that sense? Uh, that would be very uh, interesting to hear. You also present some, some of these um, uh, case studies. You have the Jewish patients, the desk masks, uh, the long cash, and then you uh, present uh, the, the, the case study in itself uh, about um, this public space building and domestication of public spaces in, in uh, Chisinau and, and Bucharest, um, which it's very interesting and, and very illustrative with, with the um, pictures you show us because I, I didn't actually grasp it with when I only read your paper. So I, th I think that is a very good case. Um, but isn't it, and this is uh, just because I don't know, uh, but, but I understand from your paper that that kind of domestication of public spaces is a general trend general European, maybe even transnational trend. So um, what you did was actually to, to use a trend to use, uh, in, in, in development in, in many other cases, in, in specific places where uh, an authoritarian heritage was, was, um, was uh, dominant, right? So did you in any way conduct any kind of reception analysis of, of what the outcome of that was? Or, or how did you in any way uh, document the, uh, the effect of the impact um, in, in those cases? And how did you report back to the Commission? Because I know that the Commission is very eager to have a documented impact. Thank you very much. Yes, oh, this is great. There is a little uh, alarm clock here. How, how, how convenient, so I can trace my seven minutes. No, five, of course. Um, I, I was stunned when I, when I read the paper how, how nice all this fits together. Or, or maybe it's just in my imagination, but then uh, indulge me for a moment here, because I think it, it fits beautifully together also, not just the two papers, but also our concerns in unrest. And uh, I, I think together the papers uh, raise some very um, intriguing questions about the limits of our own... Um, of our own activities, because now in the context of all these projects, we have uh, left academia and, and are dabbling in, as, as kind of artistic, uh, cultural practitioner, where we uh, are very concerned about our impact. And I, I think that raises very interesting questions about some of the key terms that, that you are using and interrogating. And I think one of the questions that perhaps has to, be, has to be reconsidered or we have to start thinking about is, is, is what we often use uh, and we often make fun of, this idea of the public sphere. Whose public is it? Who is communicating with whom? And perhaps when we are moving out of our role as academics into the public, however that's conceived, are we actually intervening in the right public? So are we intervening in the, in the wrong uh, publics? I think, that's a, I think that's a very good question. I'll come back uh, uh, to that with an example in a moment. Um, I was also stunned that you, um, uh, you from, from uh, um, traces, you use a couple of terms, um, you define them, use them in your text, um, and they're unproblematic in a sense. That is uh, Europe and your definition of the public sphere and what European identity entails. I want to I want to quote from your text. European spatial identity cannot be culturally defined by geographical borders, but by the self-recognition of citizens as part of the social space. That's fantastic because I think it summarizes very nicely among other things why the European Union gives us so much money perhaps. Um, <laughs> And it also, uh, if you connect it to, to Susanna's uh, case study, it shows very nicely that the core concepts are all up for grabs. They are all extremely contentious. Because those people who are, who are uh, out there in Dresden, they are 
not similarly concerned about Europe. If anything, they want to often define their distance from Europe. Um, and they are very concerned about how they perceive themselves as citizens or not, or maybe as second-class citizens. And it's, it's, at the moment, it's completely uh, not that relevant if that's just their perception or if they really have some kind of uh, problem. But this idea of what it means to be a citizen, a citizen of what um, in Europe? In, in a country, in nation states, that's, that's all, I think, uh, uh, highly problematic. And we should probably take that quite seriously and also think about the limits of memory culture and memory practice with regard to the identities but also the inequalities that are being um, expressed here, perceived or real. I want to give, again, a concrete example from your text which I find very interesting. As Hans had said, we might very well have a kind of an artistic uh, move towards the, the, um, the, the reoccupation of what you call the domestication of the public sphere, another, you know, the, where, where people take over the public, so to speak, again. That makes perfect sense. But I cannot help wondering about is perhaps this domestication of the public sphere linked to the disappearance of physical living space for people in the cities across Europe, right? Where more and more people can simply no longer live in the cities. So there's a, there's a bizarre dialectic, I, I assume, in the absence of, of apartments for people where they can afford to live and this kind of domestication. At least there is a relationship of, uh, of irony, I would argue. Then also, then again about the Dresden, um, the Dresden case study, what I find absolutely fascinating is what I would highlight as the issue of habitus that becomes central here. Uh, how do you behave properly in public? You know, what, again, uh, this is also a kind of domestication. Um, and, and for once, uh, which I rarely do uh, when I think memory and politics together, for once I saw a silver lining in your case study, and the silver lining is, that uh, the right-wing politicians, as they are striving for power and as they are negotiating their relationship of representing others in a political sphere, um, they are also being domesticated. They are also being, they are so to speak, being, uh, they, are, they are becoming best, better cosmopolitans, right? Because they are concerned about the rules. They want to follow the norms. And the right-wing politicians, especially in Germany, but many other places, they set out initially against that rules, and they have behaved extremely awkwardly in public. They cannot behave according to the rules of parliaments, for example. And these kinds of faux pas happen all the time. But they are reducing it. They are becoming, they are becoming disciplined, in a sense, because there is something at stake. So in a very strange sense, uh, the rules of the game, the, the rules of the game of the public that have been so often made fun of, seem to work in mysterious ways to turn them into distasteful, but Democrats, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense. And I think that's, that's important. Um, nevertheless, I, I think one of the things that I'll, I'll walk away from is, is, and here, so to speak, doing it from an unrest perspective, is the need to link um, analysis of memories of culture, interventions in, uh, in, memory, in cultures of memory with questions of inequality. Because I think, for example, the public spheres here you're talking about and that people are, are, are reoccupying are public spheres that for the elites have become completely valueless. This is no longer a public sphere where people meet because the elites in Europe in an age of extreme inequality have created their own public spheres. They, are, they have created their own memory culture. They don't care about these spaces any longer, which is one of the reasons why it seems to be so relatively easy to occupy them. Uh, so these kinds of, of uh, uh, inequalities, also in the case of Dresden, that we have people who have very different subject positions um, that they define as their own perception also in terms of material inequality. The, uh, the students, for example, that lack, they, they, don't, they don't have the same etiquette concerns, right? Uh, I think they have, they have less concern about not being included. I think they feel, they feel because of their education, because of the status of their families, they feel more included and have more in, in those kinds of social settings. 
Um, many of the protesters on the right, I would venture to argue, do not have that sense of being part of something that we might include uh, a public sphere. But the public spheres of the future we have to engage with in terms of memory are obviously uh, the public spheres that are virtual and not the ones that are in the cities because they have their, their importance, I think, is much reduced. So we need to, we need to realize that our own uh, um, engagement has to be mediated in different ways because in some ways what we have done, all of us, is we have focused very much on the public spheres of the 19th century and we should probably try to arrive in the 21st century rather soon, if we want more money, that is. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we had two very interesting sessions uh, this morning, and uh, we now have uh, the opportunity to uh, discuss what we've heard, um, and uh, I think there will probably be some questions or comments. Yes, Paco. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, well, yesterday, Anna, when we were defending the agonistic idea against the criti cosmopolitan critique, she reminded how important it has been the concept of hegemony, which you, again, I think is a very slippery uh, concept when thinking of the type of controversy that we think that's associated to the politicization of the past that's essentially agonistic in our view. And then I was um, thinking of Steve, Mar uh, Steve Martinez's presentation when seeing how, well, in Italy, Upon is leaving, uh, leaving those words in that building after the restoration, since there is already a uh, uh, normalization of the political perception of the past, that would have an agonistic effect. So let's say that we would have a, a different uh, hegemonic situation if we want to talk in those terms as in Spain, where we have a, a law of historical memory, which includes a chapter about changing the names of the streets that somehow still preserve the memory of the Francoism and so on. That has been a long struggle in Spain to what they call create a democratic memory. But now, for instance, we both, Paco and I, work in a national council, a research council, and the main building was built by Franco, and his name was there. It was uh, erased 10 years ago. It was criticized by the right wing. But then, since the perception of what is hegemonic, I was thinking, well, just leaving that there without touching it would have had uh, uh, agonistic effect in the Spanish context, which I don't think people will. So it seems again that if you use uh, hegemony as a background against which leaving uh, uh, scripture or something like that has an agonistic effect or not, we again uh, are going back dealing with a very slippery concept. No? Uh, and, and we cannot drop the, the idea of hegemony or the predominant mode of legitimation. We want to know what are we talking about when we talk about politicization and of the past, of the memory. Other comments or questions? Yes, Susanna? Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, actually it was almost a comment back on something that Wolf said, so I hope you'll forgive me, but because um, you said that the, you saw the, the domestication of the right wing within the political sphere as being a positive as they now follow the rules and the norms. Now, for me, I would see that as the, the biggest danger mm -hmm. rather than a positive. So, um, and I wondered whether perhaps other people who with knowledge that I don't have around, particularly around Poland or Turkey and the politics there might have a different perspective on that aspect of things. So, again, it's thinking about, you know, from a theoretical perspective, we might analyze it in, a, a, you know, in this way, in a detached way, but perhaps on the ground, um, it, it has different, you know, it, it, it plays out in different ways. Um, so I, I'm not sure I agree with you as that that's the positive. I think that's the danger. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, Hitler could also wear suits and behave in front of the Dusseldorf Industrialists Club uh, in 1932. <laughs> If we're coming to that level, then I want to answer. <laughs> you, you provoke that. Uh, I, I, I think it's uh, this, 
Of course, it, uh, it's, it's, it's an open-ended process. We don't know where it will go. Uh, but I think there are decisive differences between the political culture, let's say, for example, uh, of Turkey and the political culture in Germany, and the decisive differences even between the political culture of Poland and the political culture in Germany. Uh, and I would not, I mean, if you look at the way that the example, uh, the AfD is what we're talking about because it's a really significant force, it, it, the way that they negotiate, they have been negotiating their relationship amongst themselves uh, to their youth organization, for example, the way they have, uh, they try to handle themselves in public, in parliament, then it's a dynamic uh, scene. It hasn't, it hasn't been stable. Um, it's, it's shifting, and some of the core questions uh, that they are negotiating are, for example, the question of Holocaust memory, right? Where they misstep, and then they get it right, and then they misstep again, and then they get it right. So, for example, in the Bavarian parliament, they made a huge faux pas. That's why. Uh, a couple of weeks later, during the, the uh, ritual uh, in the Bundestag, they got, it, they got it right because they had made mistakes beforehand. I think it's too, it's too, it's too simple. We, we, don't, we don't know that yet. And the differences between the different wings of the party are, are huge. So, so in that sense, I would, if I have learned something from, from unrest, is there are voices in there that one can uh, engage with. Uh, also productively, because they seem to subscribe to some of the norms that you then can catch them uh, at. And they actually are also willing to do that. One of the reasons why they're constantly shedding uh, troops and shedding voices are precisely this process. So I think it's too, it's too, it's too easy, and maybe we should have a little more faith into the, the political culture of uh, democratically constituted cosmopolitan societies. Well, um, I very much uh, like the papers on uh, Italy and on uh, Northern Ireland because they seem to me to demonstrate uh, in very different ways uh, that there is a kind of mileage in uh, applying uh, the notion of agonistic memory uh, in different contexts. But I think both of them also, again, uh, and sorry if I sound a bit like a broken record, uh, showed in a way how strongly allied um, uh, notions of agonism are in some respects to notions of cosmopolitanism. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think um, if we consider the, the Dresden example again, it seems to me um, that here we have uh, two um, two positions, uh, a right-wing position and a left-wing position, uh, that are actually um, evading uh, a cosmopolitan frame and are both quite antagonistic uh, in their memory politics. Uh, and I think uh, if we like a kind of uh, agonistically minded cosmopolitanism uh, would try to bring the two into uh, a common discussion if that's possible. Uh, but I guess uh, that would actually be very much against uh, Mufian ideas, because over breakfast I've been discussing with Nathan, and of course, Muf's idea of a left-wing populism defeating a right-wing populism uh, is, in effect, I th think probably contradicting her earlier ideas of making enemies into adversaries. Uh, so because there still is the notion of enemy, uh, behind this, uh, uh, this idea. Uh, so I wonder whether we also need to think of ways of thinking agonism without move. I'm, I immediately saw Hans. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's uh, keep move apart in, in, in this. I think uh, Susanna's example is uh, enormously illustrative. Uh, for what an agonistic approach could change uh, in such a setting. Uh, because as I understand uh, the case, uh, we have a left wing uh, which on exclusively moral basis is pointing fingers at the right wings and say you are fascists. On a purely moral basis, because we are all morally responsible for the Holocaust. Dresden was part of Nazi Germany, and we have to take that moral uh, guilt upon us. Right? So what I'm saying is that an, an, an agonistic approach would go back to the 30s and say, why became such huge parts of the German population are responsible also for such crimes committed during the war. 
That's part of the dehumanization of the other. That's part of an authoritarian regime. That's part of the lack of democratic uh, means in a society. So with that basis, the relation between a left and a right wing movement would be different. That would not be to point the finger, finger on a moral basis and say you are, you are evil persons. That would be to say don't repeat those errors from the past. Take care, you are repeating those same errors again because, and that's the, the strength of, of that left wing uh, movement as I see it, they, they actually combine um, the memory of the past with uh, the question of migrants and refugees in the present. But that relation, if, if, if it is morally based, it will only be we are the good ones because we support the, the refugees. If it is politically based, it would be you are repeating the same errors as you did. And actually you have common interests with these people because the political situation will explain that there are strong common interests between the marginalized domestic, the, the citizens and, and uh, refugees and, and immigrants. So that would be to turn it around and, and make it political. Thank you, because I actually want to um, also comment on this because I think it's um, two words that you said also in your presentation struck me. Um, it was the power of fear at the one hand that you were you know, referring that was the kind of power they were using more at the right wing and the power of pity that you would, you know, um, address to the more left wing. Um, um, two words that are actually highly emotional and I want to comment on what you just said because it's partly something that can be solved um, uh, with education. Um, telling history and making sure that people understand you know, this is what it can do. <laughs> so understanding history will help to maybe avoid these type of uh, errors in the in the future. But uh, the fact that you used very um, terminology that is linked to emotion, and it also brings me into my mind, like, what is the alternative then in terms of a, a creation of an emotion um, if it's not fear or pity at both sides? Um, isn't there work um, to be done on the emotional level um, accompanied by education? I would like to have your, uh, <laughs> your comments on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, I think Wolf wanted to come in, and then David, and then Bill. I think one of the questions that, that one uh, uh, should perhaps emphasize also in, in bringing the different uh, theoretical perspectives together is that you are, you are rightly emphasizing the question of moralization here, but uh, of course even in MOOF there is the question of pretty hard borders at the edge. Who can who cannot be an ad adversary and who who so to speak uh, cannot be cannot be accepted as uh, as into this kind of public sphere, let's say. Um, and she is pretty clear about the fact that these adversaries have to follow um, the rule of law and they have to follow the basic rules of democratic exchange. And therefore, I, I think one of the key questions uh, emerges, um, so to speak, uh, and I hate now to quote Carl Schmidt uh, inadvertently, is the question of violence, right? Uh, that's, I think that's the, that's the decisive test case. And therefore, I would, from a theoretical perspective, I, we can look at, at Dresden perhaps somewhat more relaxed because there might be a lot of communication that we find dysfunctional, but we could also look at it looking down at it the different demonstrators, the state trying to keep them apart, uh, the state also insisting that the right wing has the, has, uh, the right to demonstrate. So, so we can also see this is kind of an agonism in practice that is, that is happening here. The, the voices uh, are in, in different ways, as difficult as it is to manage, they are, they are uh, heard. Uh, so the key question becomes one of lawlessness and violence. Those are the key questions. And now I, I completely in agreement, we have to look extremely carefully, but 
I'm not sure if looking back at the 1930s uh, is, is, is makes sense because the situation was so completely different because there was absolutely no, uh, no powerful um, constituency uh, at that point of the Weimar Republic that was willing to defend uh, the rule of law and especially the rules of democracy. That was one of the, the ironies. So therefore, the situation is also from, from our perspective uh, uh, quite differently. But those borders, they, they, they are important. Those have, they have to be watched. Where does violence take place? But then, one of the key challenges that we are facing is how is, for example, Europe uh, using violence, right? I mean, we are using violence every day by, by letting people drown in the Mediterranean. That's an extremely violent decision in the name of cosmopolitanism. Maybe that's also the scene of violence we have to look at, and not just, you know, who is, who is or is not uh, hitting each other in Dresden. David? Yeah, I'm, I'm, oh, is this working? Yes. Uh, I'm pleased that somebody's uh, raised the question of uh, emotions, because it's the thing that has been coming back into my mind throughout um, these two days, um, having been with the, you know, the unrest project since it was first being conceptualized, because um, I think if we're being self-critical for a moment, and we have lots of areas in which we can need to continue being self-critical, but um, one of the things we did want to address in the project was to think about what we can offer people um, in terms of uh, passions, as, as Muth calls them, kind of agonistic passions, the kind of uh, feelings that motivate people to actually participate in the political process, to, uh, um, to engage in the name of the ideas that they, uh, that they stand behind politically. So to keep people in, engaged in that way, you know, feeling is necessary, however we want to define it. So coming from a country where at the moment um, agonistic, no, antagonistic emotion trumps all, including fact, on both sides of the debate, you know, so at the moment we've got a very polarised situation in the UK, you know, both Leavers and Remainers have got themselves into such, such a state of heightened emotionality that they can no longer dialogue with each other. I think it's an important thing we wanted to do in this project was to think about how using these kind of heritage spaces could allow for some kind of antagonistic emotional commitment or antagonistic passion, as Move calls it. I mean, we may want to jettison her idea, but when we've been talking about agonism here, I've quite often felt as drifting into the realms of, oh, well, I can see all different perspectives. That feels like a very rational uh, kind of approach, but at the end of the day, one can see all different perspectives, but then does one not have to commit to one of those perspectives? Mm -hmm. And that requires some kind of emotional, passionate, whatever you want to call it, commitment for the democratic process to continue. And I, I sort of feel like we may have lost sight of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, to so come back to the subject of Dresden again. It was, I also found Susanna's paper very interesting and what struck me was the way the Holocaust, and that's what you flagged up, was being used by both groups um, as a way of mobilizing their own position. And I suppose you, if, however we understand cosmopolitan memory, you're not going to make that argument again, but if we were to say, okay, the cosmopolitan model involves using the Holocaust to mobilize sympathy for other groups, then this was being done both by the left and by the right. Uh, and this is clearly problematic, so we'd end up saying, well, there's a good cosmopolitanism. That's where we compare, where we say, uh, we committed the Holocaust in the past, so we cannot compare it to something like Dresden because we're the, we're the, we're the, we were the perpetrator, so that would be inappropriate. And the other group would say, well, no, there are similarities um, between the Holocaust and um, the bombing war, and these similarities are ones we need to consider in, in responding to political situations in the present. Is that, therefore, the, the wrong one? No, there isn't a right one and there isn't a wrong one. They're clearly both different subject positions, but they both use the Holocaust. In one case, we'd form more, feel more comfortable than with the other. So where would agonism, where would the next step take us if we brought those two groups together to talk about their different uses, their different mobilizations of the Holocaust? That was just a sort of question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the far right end there. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Um, I, 
um, I've come in at the end and, and, and heard this, the talk, really, the, your, is the summing up, and the, um, the lady over there who spoke about emotion and the gentleman just spoke there really um, made me want to say this, which is that a, a, on Holocaust Memorial Day a year ago, there was a program on the radio, it was a Sunday morning program called Broadcasting House, and um, it's a topical kind of program, an intelligent program. And a gentleman had got in contact with them to say that he was a German man living in England, that he had found out that his grandfather was a Nazi and his grandfather had actually loaded Jews into trains to be transported. And he didn't know what to do and he carried the burden. And what he decided he wanted to do was to make contact with his local synagogue. And he did that, and it was a very painful and sensitive negotiation, first of all. He's just an ordinary guy. And subsequently, this year, like two weeks ago, Holocaust Memorial Day, they did an update on that. And, the com and they, him and uh, a lady, I don't know what her position was exactly, but they talked across the year, and he'd been coming in and going to a, to a Jewish school to tell them about his predicament and this sharing between the knowledge, the, the listening, the painful listening that has to happen with, especially work with children, it, uh, they heard him and they told him their story. So this is a really healing kind of moment that's taking place and I think it's very important that it's the action that people take is crucial. So we can talk and talk, but then a small action like that will have tremendous effect because they will, they're beginning to grow, they're beginning to build a program where they can go to the other schools and speak. Yeah, that's Thank you. Well, I think we will probably, uh, is that, was there, uh, sorry? Ah, sorry, yes. I just, my reflection was that I don't, I wonder if it's really the, I think it's not that we don't know how to talk about it. I guess in the case of Dresden, for example, the, the Military History Museum, I think the solution how they talk about bombings in context of other Nazi bombings of other cities, speaking about German victims of the Dresden bombing, but also pointing to German perpetratorship at the same time. I think it's in a, on an intellectual kind of level, it's a, this is, kind of the solution you're sort of searching for. I think the problem is those people on the streets, they don't want to engage in such a discussion, yes. And I think it's, I wouldn't be so positive as, as Wolf is because there has been violence in Dresden and elsewhere. And also it's, uh, it's the violent talk a vial, uh, which very easily, as we know from Polish case, but I don't know if this political cultures are so far, very easily turns into physical violence. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I think we will probably be discussing uh, these issues uh, over lunch uh, now, and um, uh, I hope that you, like me, enjoyed the last one and a half days. I think they have been um, intellectually, for me, very fruitful. And uh, I also hope that uh, uh, those inside unrest and those uh, who uh, have been here joining us from outside will remain in touch and can continue to discuss this in various forums uh, over the next uh, few years. I just wanted finally um, to um, thank uh, in particular uh, all of those uh, inside uh, unrest. Uh, it has been a great experience, I think, over the last three or four years, depending on how you count, um, to uh, do this project uh, with you. And uh, particular thanks perhaps to Anna and to Hans, uh, without whose uh, article in uh, memory studies, uh, I think this would not have happened. So I think uh, it's great uh, that uh, you uh, started us off 
um, thinking about uh, these issues and I think also from my side a very particular thanks to uh, Nina Weke and Christina Kondovici, the uh, coordinators for this project who have managed with uh, great patience uh, to uh, keep us all uh, on the straight and narrow so that uh, we can now uh, enter the final weeks of this project with uh, confidence of uh, uh, actually also uh, surviving the uh, final evaluation by, uh, by Brussels, um, which uh, will take place uh, in May. So thanks everyone for coming, for discussing, and I'm sure we will be seeing each other again. Thank you.